Good morning, uh, bon dia, buenos dias. Uh, my name is Antoni Plasencia and I'm the director of the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. It's global and very happy uh, to be here with you uh, from many parts uh, around uh, to, uh, to participate to, to, this, uh, uh, to this workshop. Uh, let me first uh, introduce uh, 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 Dr. Ignasi uh, López Verdaguer, who is the Director of Science at the Fundación La Caixa, who is hosting this event. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Antonio Plasencia. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you today to the Caixa Forum. Recording in progress. Okay, now? Can you hear me? Yeah, better. And I will be very, very brief because the important is, thing is that uh, my colleagues here uh, explain you the objectives of the workshop, but I would like to remind you that as uh, proud um, members of the board of uh, IS Global, uh, we're very happy to continue supporting the organization uh, in the long term. Uh, you know that La Caixa Foundation uh, contributes modestly to the ecosystem of research uh, biomedical and health research funding in Spain, doing several uh, competitive programs, but as well uh, giving uh, structural support to four research uh, centers, and IES Global is uh, one of them, of course. And uh, I would like to say as well only that, um, well, this is, of course, an enormous challenge that we, that we have ahead, uh, epidemic preparedness. We've, we've suffered uh, the consequences, all of us, so it is uh, something that I want uh, speak about because this is going to be uh, debated by yourself and, and introduced by my colleagues here. But of course, for La Caixa Foundation, it is very important as well. I would like to tell you that, for example, on our next um, uh, the conference of European foundations that is going to take place in Barcelona in four weeks' time, we are gathering there a thousand delegates uh, that are going to uh, discuss together what uh, the role of foundations will be in the next uh, years and uh, the uh, relationship between climate and health and ec epidemic preparedness is one of the main subjects of the conference. So we believe that the issue is of the maximum importance. And uh, I, I would say as well that the IS Global is in, in the best possible position to uh, try to cope with this kind of, uh, of issues, uh, basically because of two things, many others probably. I'm sorry if I if I miss any of them. But first of all, because uh, the excellent research that they, that they do in the, uh, in the area of the exposome or the, 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 the environment that affects uh, our health in many different um, uh, ways, radiations, uh, uh, contamination, etc., etc. But the other, and especially because they have and they have amazingly fulfill the mission of translating science in Poli politics and practices, and this is very uh, signif significant, I would say, um, characteristic of, of IS Global, which makes them uh, very special, and this is one of the reasons uh, because La Caixa Foundation, or why La Caixa Foundation keeps uh, uh, giving their support. Uh, I would like to finish here, only just to, to thank you for choosing having this meeting here, and tomorrow in, in Madrid, uh, thank you very much for the work that you are doing in relation to this uh, enormous challenge. And just please enjoy the conference to you. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, Ignazi. Uh, and thank you for hosting this in this uh, nice modernistic building. It's also an opportunity to get acquainted with some of the creativity uh, that took place uh, in the, in the, starting in the mid uh, 19th centuries and which is very characteristic of Barcelona. So going uh, in, in to, to, to business today, uh, by the way, as you've seen, this is a hybrid uh, event, so a number of people are following uh, online. Uh, thank you also for following and, and also uh, for, for uh, providing us with feedback later. Uh, so just a, a quick snapshot 
of what is, is global and why uh, is global is organizing this. And then I'll give the floor to, to my two colleagues who are the two souls, one from science, uh, uh, Professor Elizabeth Cardis, who's research professor at Is Global and uh, the director of the radiation program with a long standing experience in the area of uh, radiation threats. Uh, and uh, also um, 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 Gonzalo. Gonzalo, I was looking, sorry, <laughs> Gonzalo Fanjul, who is a director of policy at this global, uh, and therefore the, the policy uh, component of this, of this uh, collective thinking. Uh, so, uh, as, uh, which, as was just mentioned earlier, uh, is a little bit at the core of our model. This global is an academic uh, research, translation, and education institution uh, with uh, precisely a global mission, a global health mission that has to do uh, with understanding that health, health problems uh, don't understand uh, about uh, geographic or political borders, and that uh, global health threats are precisely one of the challenges of, of global health. Putting in perspective also uh, the, the, the impact on equity and the role of these, uh, uh, among others, these health crises, the impact on, on equity. So uh, as such, uh, our agenda, our research agenda and our transition agenda involves both infectious diseases and maternal and child health, but also chronic diseases and the role of the environment and of the climate. Uh, and so this is a little bit uh, our, our uh, DNA in terms of, of research with a commitment towards translation. So understanding that it's not enough that research institutions provide uh, new knowledge sometimes associated innovations, but also that we are committed to trying to bring uh, the, the new knowledge and the innovations to impact, so closer to, to policy uh, settings, to the policy arena, and to the policy uh, decisions. And uh, two other aspects that I'd like to highlight of our, a little bit of, of, of what constitutes the, uh, some of our distinctiveness uh, as an institution are global partnerships. We have uh, long-standing partnerships both in the global south, especially in Africa, especially in Mozambique and Morocco, but also in other countries, also in, in Latin America, and of course also in the wealthier countries of the global north with whom we uh, partner for research, for translation, for education. And finally, our governance, as was just uh, described, uh, we have uh, a, a, a very uh, mm, a, a, a very plural governance that includes both the philanthropic private sector from La Caixa Foundation, but also two universities and two hospitals, which whom we are affiliated, and three levels of governance. Uh, the Spanish government, including research, uh, health, and, uh, and foreign affairs, and also the Catalan government, including research, uh, health and, and the environment, and finally the city of Barcelona. So a little bit this uh, contributes to uh, our local, and I'm underlying our local, global and local commitment and, and, and activities. So uh, with the, the, the pandemic, of course, all research institutions, everybody, but among others, our research institutions were compelled to provide uh, uh, answers from our previous knowledge, but also from the uh, and our previous capabilities, but also from new uh, new capabilities and new opportunities, and this is around precisely the uh, some of the, uh, the the responses to the pandemic that uh, um, many uh, projects were started. Some projects were reoriented precisely to to to, to respond uh, somehow to, to to the challenges of knowledge. And uh, among that, uh, uh, a group that was led uh, by my two colleagues here uh, has been uh, putting together a little bit the lessons that we've learned internally and also to identify a little bit some of the next steps that make sense both, as I was saying, from the point of view of research, of innovation, and of translation uh, in general. So this is a little bit the background uh, of why we are organizing uh, this, uh, this workshop in the understanding that also we, we call ourselves a little bit an intermediary institution. So 
uh, many of the challenges that we've been that we are discussing when we're talking about global health, in this case challenges, have to do with putting together, bringing together actors and stakeholders that non not necessarily meet together or necessarily work together. And uh, this, I, I think, is also part of the objective, uh, of the objective of these two days that my colleagues will explain. So, thank you very much. Let me just close with uh, a quote that I often used. I've often used in the last two years from Edgar Morin, who uh, most of you know, actually he's 100 years now uh, old, so uh, um, with a long experience when he says, uh, uh, expect the unexpected. So basically uh, today it's about reminding us that we need to expect the unexpected and if I may add, be prepared for that. So thank you very much. And now I'll hand over the, the floor to Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Tony. And thank you, Ignacy, for hosting us in this lovely place. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, those of you who are here and those of, us, those of you who are with us uh, online. Uh, as Tony said, I'm Elizabeth Cardis. I'm the head of the radiation program uh, at East Global. Um, as introduced already, this workshop builds upon the preparedness and response work that we have been doing for many years at East Global in relation to nuclear accidents, in, in collaboration, in fact, with Thierry Schneider, who's be one of their first speakers, and all of the work that so many of us uh, at East Global and everywhere have been carrying out over the last a bit more than two years since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think, uh, personally, what struck me early on is how many of the observations that we made um, uh, in the aftermath of the Chernobyl and the Fukushima nuclear accidents were directly applicable or translatable to the COVID-19 situation. And how some of the recommendations we made in the Shamisen project together with Thierry, who was drawing the lessons from these nuclear accidents, could have been applied early on to the COVID situation and perhaps help uh, to preserve a little bit the mental health, uh, social uh, impacts uh, uh, of the COVID in the population. So basically, based on that arose the idea of developing an all hazards approach to preparedness, response, recovery, and building resilience. Uh, what we have coined PR3, preparedness, response, uh, recovery, and resilience. Um, and basically trying to build this in collaboration with our partners, it is global of course, but at the local, regional, national, European, and global levels. And also to, for ES Global to try to add its grain of salt, uh, to find a mechanism for us to contribute in a coordinated fashion, our expertise and our enthusiasm towards this goal. Uh, so with this in mind, we've developed the concept of PR3 together with the researchers, the policy and global development with communication, education and innovation that is global. Over the last uh, bit over a year, uh, we've developed uh, a strategic research agenda. We are actively searching for funds and for uh, partnerships and building a network of collaborators. And one of the really, really important uh, first steps in our activities is this workshop today and tomorrow, where we would aim to draw the lessons uh, related to PR3 from the different complementary environmental and public health crises, um, including nuclear accidents, including pandemics, including chemical, radiological, uh, chemical and occupational accidents, volcanoes and natural uh, disasters, climate change, and obviously something we should not forget refugee crisis related to war, where there's a lot of actually similarities. Um, so to draw these lessons and discuss how, what is common, what is different, and how best we could incorporate these into a future all hazards preparedness plans at the global, regional, country, and local levels. And although we have speakers here, we've uh, foreseen a lot of time for discussions. We really would like to have brainstorming, and in fact, we have a brainstorming session at the end of the day. We really want to come out of this workshop with some ideas and maybe some plans to all work together in the future. Um, and possibly, I mentioned that uh, we would like to have probably a, a joint uh, publication on the outcome of this workshop, at least for the scientific part and possibly summarizing also the institutional part and something we'll be discussing later on uh, in the day. I think, Gonzalo, you have things to add in about the, today's workshop. Thank you, Elisa. And good morning to everyone and to the people that are watching us uh, online. 
I must say that uh, uh, it's proving very challenging in these days to try to gather the people in person in this in this event that we have uh, for the whole event for today and tomorrow over 500 people uh, registered for the for the event. So we are hoping that during the day of today and in the morning of tomorrow there will be many more joining this conversation. I just want to emphasize something that uh, was said uh, before about uh, the, 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 the kind of conversation that we want to open here uh, uh, in this very important uh, challenge. And it is related to what I believe is the soul of our organization and the soul of our collaboration with La Caixa as well, which is this whole idea of bringing together science and translation. So this idea that uh, we are knowledge creators, but also we have a mandate to influence not just policies and practices, but I would argue that increasingly we want to influence narratives. We want to influence the way the public conversation is being shaped, which is something that uh, is, uh, as, as, you, as you know very well, a, a problem that has, been, uh, that has been very clear during this pandemic, what we are now, the, the term that has been coined as infodemic, something that we might discuss during the day of, of today. No? During COVID, during the past two years, uh, scientists and practitioners have been forced to work together almost in a high-speed laboratory, making decisions uh, almost on real time. It has been extremely stressing, but it has proved our capacity and our potential to work together. And our aim, our aspiration, is to do that properly, to do that in advance of the emergencies, that, of the emergencies and the crisis that are to come. No? The, 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 this very week, there is an important book coming out from Bill Gates on how to prevent the next pandemic. You know that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with which we work as an institution, has been very adamant on trying to, to put pressure on, on, on this idea of pandemic, of pandemic preparedness. We extend the systemic risk to many areas, as, as my colleagues have mentioned before. No? But it is critical for us that now that we are challenging new emergencies in the form of a war, in the form of uh, inflation in many, that we do not forget the lessons that we have mainly uh, uh, learned during these two years. And we invest now in the kind of systems that we will need to prevent the, the, crisis, the crisis to come. So with that in mind, uh, we, we welcome you. Let me revise very briefly the, the day of today and, and what, we are going, what we are going to do. We have designed this uh, workshop of, of today. In my mind, and, and you will allow me, I am the non-scientist in this, in this table, but in my mind, this is a vertical and a horizontal uh, model. In a sense, we will devote the, the morning to the, to the issues that uh, we want to address when we talk about uh, uh, preparedness uh, and response. We will talk about infectious diseases, of course, but we will also talk about uh, chemical and occupational disasters. We will talk about radiological disasters, natural disasters, and volcano eruptions, something that uh, we've, been, we've been living very closely in Spain uh, in, in the last, in the last uh, months in, in La Palma. We will talk about climate change, of course, and we will talk about war and refugees. So we will try to cover, with this vertical approach, a number of issues, probably uh, uh, not, not, not all, all of, the, of the risks that we are facing, but certainly I, I think it's a, it's a good comprehensive view. No? And then in the afternoon, we will try to take this horizontal approach, uh, talking and listening to the institutions that are trying to address to, uh, these challenges from different perspectives. And I must say that uh, in the, the afternoon that, that unfortunately I will be moderating is kind of a Marx Brothers uh, cabin uh, where we, we are having uh, more people that I think that, that we can handle. But to be honest, uh, uh, everybody is absolutely indispensable in this, in this conversation. No? So we will hear from the WHO at the uh, Sendai framework for disaster, result, from, uh, for disaster re uh, risk uh, reduction. We will hear from the Global Fund uh, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. From MSF, uh, uh, the uh, responsible uh, ITOR, uh, who will be coming this afternoon, just arrived yesterday from Ukraine. So he will bring a very fresh perspective of how to handle uh, these uh, challenges. Uh, DNDI, the Drugs for Neglected uh, Diseases uh, uh, Initiative. Uh, then we will take 
a more geographical approach, institutions that are working at the regional level, like the European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, then the uh, European uh, Global Health Research Institute's Network, EGRIM, uh, the European Foundation on Preparedness, and WHO Europe as well, and then we will open a window to the Latin American or the Pan American uh, region with the Pan American Health Organization, to Africa with the Africa Center for Disease Control, uh, Dr. Wesson, who is accompanying uh, us uh, here. And then uh, nationally, we will talk uh, at the regional level uh, with the Public Health Agency of Catalonia and at the local level with the Public Health Agency of Barcelona. Unfortunately, uh, at, the, at the very last minute, um, uh, an unexpected event uh, has impeded the Ministry of Health to accompany us uh, today at the national level. We will have them tomorrow in, in, in Madrid, uh, hopefully. No? And then we will have the perspective of the United States with the NIH uh, and the Disaster Research Response Program. And finally, uh, the, the inspiring experience of Luxembourg uh, with the Laboratoire National de la Santé. So, as you can see, you can understand now the, the Mars Brothers uh, 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 coming uh, uh, image uh, that, I, that I suggested, but, but actually I think that it's going to be a challenging but a fascinating conversation. No? And then tomorrow we bring the conversation to Madrid. We, we thought that it was, it, was, it was pertinent to have the two venues, uh, and uh, we will have a more policy-oriented or politically-oriented uh, uh, panel in Madrid, Davos style, with, uh, with uh, nine representatives covering a number of institutions working in this area, uh, and you can, you can check that uh, in, in, our, in our program. So, there are a number of experts here, a number of experts online, a number of experts that uh, will accompany us uh, uh, tomorrow. We, we aim to contribute to a critical conversation a conversation that is taking place in many other areas that we, we hope to foster with, with, our, with our event here. We hope to strengthen the coalitions that uh, are willing to work together, coalitions of experts of different areas, of experts of different capacities, scientists, practitioners, willing to contribute to this fundamental area of that we have called as PR3. Uh, I'm sure that there are, there are many possible definitions for uh, for this. So welcome again to Barcelona, and we wish you a, a fantastic day of, of work. And thank you again for joining us today. And, and I think that we, we can start uh, uh, right now. No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> okay. So. Um, I would like to call the speakers of the next sessions, possibly if you don't mind sitting here, this way we can have also a discussion. So, Anya, Roberto, Thierry, if you don't mind joining us up here. Women on one side and men on the other. Yeah, yeah? perfect. Then the screen is so funny. No, no, it's fine. Uh, let's see if this works. Yeah. Okay, so this is. Um, is everything okay online? Everybody can hear online and participate, yeah? Yeah? Yes, works well. Okay, perfect. Absolutely, Okay, so um, I'd like to open the session, the thematic session, with the idea of reviewing uh, the scientific PR3 strategies for different types of crises. So we have six speakers. The first three, fortunately, are here. The other three are online. Uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes, possibly 14 minutes if you can, so we can have a minute or so of, of uh, questions. And at the end, we'll have uh, an hour to discuss um, the commonalities and differences uh, with the idea of how we could go uh, towards a common approach to PR3. So it's my pleasure to introduce, I can't pronounce your name, Anya how do you say, Schreier? Schreier. Schreier. Yeah. Uh, from Erasmus MC in the Netherlands to talk to us about pandemic lessons for disaster preparedness. Anja. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, this is on. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I would like to thank the organization for uh, inviting me. I think it's a very important meeting and very important discussions we should have now. So uh, my name is Anja Schreier. I'm a medical doctor in infectious disease control. I have a PhD in epidemiology and a master in public health. At the moment, I'm the medical director of the Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Center in Rotterdam. I will tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, but during the crisis, I was head of the Department of Infectious Diseases in Amsterdam. 
at the public health service and I was a member of the outbreak management team that advises uh, our government, so in the front line. And the Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Center actually is a coalition between three uh, universities, uh, three, uh, three, um, so the Erasmus University, the T Delft and the Erasmus Medical Center. So we almost forget what was already in place before this uh, pandemic started. Um, after the uh, SARS in 2003, uh, 146 countries around the world, including all the WHO member states, stated that they have a shared responsibility to protect the world from outbreaks. So um, the international health regulation, uh, regulations represent an agreement, sorry, 196 actually, it started smaller, <laughs> to work together for global health security. And all countries have, uh, have decided that they should report events of international uh, public health re uh, importance. So that includes making sure that surveillance systems are in order, that they work together with countries to make decisions in public health emergencies that you report specific diseases uh, plus any potential international public health emergencies and that you respond to these public health events. Um, all these, uh, so these international health regulations are of course translated to local laws and this is just the example that I show you here is in the Netherlands. So every doctor but also laboratory uh, has to uh, notify uh, certain uh, diseases, infectious diseases to the local public health service who can then start their uh, testing and tracing and even give people antibiotics or give them vaccination if possible or even, even shut certain kind of schools or uh, other uh, institutes. But I can tell you that uh, lockdowns were not in these guidelines and that's something I think one of the lessons learned is that the guidelines we have were not um, totally fit for, uh, for a big pandemic as the one we experienced. The Public Health Service then uh, notifies the diseases to the National Public Health Institute, who in their turn notifies the ECDC, uh, the European Centre of Disease Control, and the WHO in Europe. But then COVID started, and I think we, uh, we all um, agree that it didn't go uh, by the book. Um, so we had insuff insufficient uh, IC capacity. Uh, we didn't have enough uh, protection material. We didn't have enough test capacities. We didn't have uh, enough source and contact uh, investigators. And so, uh, so this is only the first year. Uh, and we went into lockdown, of course, already in March. We did a massive scaling up into public health uh, services. We trained uh, hundreds of contract tracers. Like for example, my team was only four nurses working every day and one doctor. And during the outbreaks, it was like, uh, like three, 400 people every day working doing uh, sourcing contact tracing. Um, and that's not even taking into account the people who were vaccinating, who were testing, etc. And then, of course, uh, later on in the year after we thought uh, we could have a nice summer <laughs> and people started to celebrate and festivals were on again. Uh, we had to pay the bill in autumn uh, with new m m mutations and measurements uh, lost their effect. What also happened is that uh, there was a lot of ten the tension was growing between professionals, politics and society. Uh, this is a, a picture of four of us, or five of us who were members of the outbreak management team, including Marion Koopmans, who is a professor in virology. She's actually the founder of the Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Center, who also um, a few of us really experienced threats, huh? people coming at our houses and uh, threatening us and putting an, us on a list of uh, being Nazis and all that of kind of really nasty threats. That was something we didn't really uh, expect either. What also was interesting is that uh, there was a blurred line between politics and professionals, I think. Uh, like for example, in our parliament, at a certain point there were questions about how we should do the contract tracing, how many phone calls we should do, and because Germany was doing six phone calls and we only did two, and so <laughs> it was... It was very interesting uh, to experience that as well. 
And uh, what we also experienced that uh, at the end of the day, there were, uh, there were not many rowers in the boat, but a lot of st steering men who, th who thought who were trying to tell us how we should row the boat. And of course, protests uh, came. But eventually, uh, the vaccination uh, strategy started, and I think we did quite well uh, at the end with over 80%, uh, 85% of the vaccination um, level. So what were the key lessons uh, then? So of course, there were many bottlenecks. Of course, I think it's quite uh, amazing that uh, in March uh, 2020, we didn't have enough, we didn't even have tests or test capacity. And within a year, I'm looking at my daughter who's going to school and doing a self-test by herself. And it's, uh, I think that's also one of the uh, greater victories as well, I think, in science, that we managed to get these tests and that we managed to to develop these vaccines. But of course, there were many bottlenecks in the amount of nurses, uh, the amount of doctors uh, who had to work, and who had to work really hard, and still are also, uh, also caught COVID, and now really a lot of them uh, experience long COVID syndrome. So yeah. Also, of course, the, the measurements didn't uh, really uh, hold for long. Um, and of course, the mutations and uh, the vaccine development. As we of course knew that uh, that was important and that was actually quite in place is the, the surveillance. But um, I think what wasn't really in place is uh, the scenario thinking. We really, uh, and we all acknowledge that now as well, we really went from from press conference to press conference or from uh, from outbreak to outbreak, from new, um, uh, new uh, from getting a vaccine to, to experiencing that the new uh, variants didn't, uh, didn't work very well. And I think an um, important lesson is that you, we should make scenarios more in front that you can already think of uh, the fact that viruses will m mutate, uh, the vaccines will, uh, of course, work for a while, but lose their effect. People will uh, stop um, following up on these measurements, etc. So that's something we really think we should do better. And um, we used, of course, and I think every country did a lot of models. And I think um, uh, f f some of them were fitted quite well at the beginning of the epidemic. But during the epidemic, when we had a more heterogeneous um, uh, spread of the disease, of vaccination levels, the models really didn't fit anymore. And it was quite difficult to predict the effect of certain measurements that we advised. And last, but uh, certainly not le least, is uh, the role of behavior scientists. I mean, we can think of any test, we can think of any vaccine, but if people are not taking them, if not doing the test, or not uh, following up on the measurements, uh, you end up nowhere. So um, I think that's a very important thing. And also, uh, the, I'm, not I'm not sure if there are behavior scientists today who are joining us, but I think this is a very important group of professionals that, um, that we... Uh, should work with more. Um, this is an example of something we did with a few <coughs> people, uh, not only people from, uh, from infectious disease control point of view, but also with uh, social scientists and even a few mayor joined us. We tried to think of, and uh, this was actually in the beginning of this year, um, what, how can we make society more resilient? And one of the things we came up with is that actually you have to make, like you have a weather alarm, you should also have a pandemic alarm. Whereas uh, when, you, when you see uh, a, new, uh, a new virus coming, <coughs> that you should um, adjust, that society knows, okay, it's that time of the year again, we have to put the masks on, uh, the chairs need one and a half meter in between, or a meter, depending on the country you live in. <laughs> And uh, we should uh, work from home again, do more hybrid uh, uh, meetings like this. And um, so that's, that's something we advised our government uh, to think of. And it's actually, uh, they're dis discussing this now with the certain sectors. Uh, yeah. So this, um, so this is actually, so these are a few scenarios of COVID we came up with in the beginning of the year that eventually it will turn out to be a common cold. We hope so, although uh, recent studies show that also the Omicron is as serious at the, as the previous uh, virus um, variants. 
And uh, that at the moment that we were making this scenario was the beginning of this year, uh, we were still struggling in a, we were still in a continuous struggle with lockdowns, etc., cetera, and, and, and travel restrictions, etc. But if you want to make that lighter green area a bit broader, you have to make society more resilient. So that's what we're trying to uh, uh, show here. So lessons learned, um, what I didn't mention before, of course, but I'm sure we'll hear that from you as well, is the challenges in data access and data analytics, the action, uh, and, and to make them also action, actionable. Um, the scenario thinking, what I mentioned before, needs some more uh, development and also incorporation. Um, that knowledge of behavior change is key. Um, that the, the current st structure that we uh, that we have uh, with the international health regulations, but also within local government, works quite well for short-term outbreaks, and we also manage to to, uh, to 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 beat quite a few infections like measles, polio, etc. But uh, it's not good enough for long-term pandemics. <clears throat> And what I think uh, is really needed is a good decision-making framework that not only includes the impact on the spread of the infection, but also the impact on society, economics, mental health, and, um, and that we actually, in, in that way, only if we, if we make such a framework as scientists and advisors of our governments at the start, we are able to better advise in the future. Long-term vision, of course, and also here the interdisciplinary approach that, uh, that is also, uh, also here today. Better international coordination because every country had their own guidelines and their own uh, uh, laws and own uh, travel bans, etc. And I think we should really do that better next time. And last but not least, uh, we really need structural finance or investments for this by the government and not only... Uh, from project to project, uh, some funding from, from research and some funding here, and then it stops after four years and you're back at square one. No, you really need long-term investments from that. Um, so what's next? Yeah, so this is not the end. Um, of course, first of all, we have to deal with the long-term effects of the uh, pandemic, uh, severe fatigue, for example. But also new infectious, of course, coming up, like uh, avian influenza is quite a big sorrow we have at the moment, <coughs> with, uh, with spread by birds, uh, African swine fever, and also across the world, several other, other big threats. Um, and I think, um, yeah, we should uh, um, make scenarios also for these kind of uh, infections. And of course, climate change that was mentioned already at the start that will, uh, that will force new animal encounters. This is a nice study that was published uh, last month. Um, and they modeled that by 2070, climate change uh, will be driving many mammal species to cooler regions. And then these species will meet and they will spread uh, their viruses and their viruses will meet as well. And that will make new strains that will, that will, that will, that will result in new kind of viruses that also humans can, uh, can get and get sick of. Um, I think we will hear more about this later by the, our WHO colleagues who will be joining us, but I think what's a very good thing is that the WHO in, and together with, uh, with Germany started the um, pandemic uh, hub. And um, so they will, <clears throat> they will focus on pandemic and epidemic uh, intelligence for better data, better analytics and better decisions. And I will close with a few, few slides about uh, our own initiative, the Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Center in Rotterdam. And I think it's sort of the same vision that we all have here today is that uh, the complexity of the pandemics and disasters really require convergence, a systematic, or a systematic view and a combined approach and a continuous and long-term commitment. Um, this is something I already mentioned earlier, but we have the same risk driver for pandemics that are apl applicable also for water-related disasters. So this is the leadership team. So this is Marion Koopman. She was the initiator and the founder. Um, next to her is Bas Jonkman. He's a professor in uh, mainly water-related crisis. I think that's the timer. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, will, I, I, will, I will finish. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Don't it's okay. <laughs> and uh, Pearl Dijkstra and her background is in, uh, in, uh, so, in, in social, societal uh, preparedness. And uh, I've introduced myself. 
So this is our strategic research agenda. We are really focusing on uh, climate and water-related disasters first. We really chose to focus that, and on pandemics, of course, zoonotic, so vector-borne diseases, and on the crossovers in between. So uh, how do you uh, prepare for... Um, uh, prepare for both, and I think uh, common grounds are uh, surveillance, sensing and monitoring, risk modeling, forecasting, uh, but also societal preparedness, uh, policy and governments, and also resilient health systems. So we started, uh, we, it was launched last summer, almost a year ago, and we started with a few, few front-runner projects, uh, and um, so they made their research plans so one of them is about climate change and increased risk of vector-borne diseases. The other one is uh, airborne. It's called airborne. It's really about how do you predict that the virus is actually airborne? How do you measure it and how do you quantify it? And what can you do against it? Uh, we work to, so this is doctors working with uh, people with a more technical uh, background. And it's really interesting to, to, to hear these discussions. Also, uh, a front runner on pandemic lessons, like, uh, like we're having today for flood pre disaster preparedness, and that's really about uh, how, do you, uh, how do you get your governance in order, uh, and how, do you, um, how can you learn from the decision making that has been do being done in, during the pandemics, and uh, how can you uh, adapt that to other crises. Also here, the social and urban resilience and uh, integrated early warning systems and scenario thinking. So that was my presentation. You can visit our website, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. We don't have much time. Is there a burning question? Otherwise, we discuss during the discussion session afterwards. Yes? Uh, do we have a microphone? Sorry, just uh, because we have so many people online, if you don't mind using a microphone. Just one second. Could you introduce yourself too, please? Sorry, here's the microphone. Yeah, thank you. You men, I'm Martin Andler from France. You you mentioned uh, the uh, transfer of the international health regulation into national law. Yeah. Did something happen at the European level? So first the transcription into European uh, directives and then international law or just directly into national laws? Well, actually health is all on a nation, under national law and there's not a lot of European law uh, on health. I think that's, that is actually a lesson learned that we should have more law on a European level. So... Uh, there's, there's, so there's the international health regulations, and there's a few laws, I think, on, uh, on, uh, of course, uh, medical uh, med medication, but not. So everybody uh, incorporated uh, the international health regulations in their own way. So that, so that, for, that's a little bit of a challenge, I think. And we should do better next time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well. Now move to the next presentation. Do you want to come here to be closer to the screen, Roberto? Because oh, I, I actually stay here. <laughs> okay. okay, perfect. This way. Oh, yeah, the pointer. Yeah. So I get the thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to introduce Roberto Lucchini, who talked to us about chemical and occupational disasters. And you just arrived from the US a couple of days ago, no? <laughs> I'm actually coming from, from Italy right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for inviting me. This is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to discuss something that you can see here related to uh, major, uh, let's say, chemical occupations, not only chemical, but anyways, I, I'm trying to make the point of how important it is uh, to... We don't see it here? No, we don't see it. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't see the, we don't see the slides on the, on the screen in the back, sorry. Ah, okay. okay, now yes, thank you. So I think this is self-explanatory. This is the huge toxic cloud that uh, was produced by the, the tower collapse uh, after, right after at N9-11. And so you have this image here, which is self-explanatory. I was thinking about the pandemic. For the pandemic, you don't see the virus. And, that's, and to me, that makes a difference. Here, nobody will, will question that this is a threat. And whereas with the pandemic and the virus, somebody would think, wait, maybe, maybe it's not true or something like that. In this case, it's so, it's so real 
And, uh, uh, and you can see the workers here, the 9-11 workers, months after 9-11, working on the pile for, for uh, uh, rescue and recovery operations. Uh, for months. Here is another self-explanatory picture. What do you see in this picture? You see this welder here and look at him. He doesn't have a respiratory uh, device, so that was obviously a, a problem. And, uh, and so uh, here's a colleague of us who uh, unfortunately Paul Lioy passed away recently. He was a, an exposure scientist. He ran from New Jersey to uh, ground zero to do what? To collect samples of dust in outdoor and uh, indoor. So thanks to those samples, uh, we know what was in the dust, obviously. It's very important because we understand a lot of different uh, uh, components that, this is not really working, sorry, <laughs> the point is uh, A lot of different components, it's maybe the battery's dead. Uh, a lot of different components. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's the bottom of the top. Yeah, I know the bottom, but it's not working. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's not working. Okay. Yeah, it's not working. Okay. Okay. So you see a lot of components of uh, it will be helpful. So thank you if you can change the battery. Okay, yeah, for forward lessons. To see a, a lot of different compounds. So a, this concept of a mixture of different toxic elements uh, and including. Mm -hmm. Is it working? Pero el, el uh, pointer. Mind. El láser no funciona. Sí. El láser es más difícil, sí, sí, sí. Se ve muy flojo. No, yo sé, pero no. Ah, claro. Uh, well, anyways, a lot of, the, a lot of different compounds, uh, a mixture, uh, you see, the, uh, we don't have the time, but anyways, uh, many of them are carcinogens, and, uh, but the concept of this mixture, mixture of different elements uh, at a very high concentration for a relatively short period of time, and uh, you can see also from this perspective here, in the, in the beginning you have coarse particles, larger particles, and later on more fine and ultra fine particles. And, and we understand that this is, is kind of projecting a, a difference uh, on the health outcomes of the responders many years later. So in the beginning, they were coughing, the World Trade Center cough, they were coughing desperately. There are videos you can see on YouTube of reporters who were actually coughing themselves. It was terrible condition. They ran to the hospitals. Uh, Mount Sinai in New York was uh, the main one where there was a center for occupational medicine. So they were actually naturally going there because they were coughing desperately. And uh, that was the first condition. And that cough actually was acute, but then it became a chronic condition. Chronic condition with a lot of lung diseases and uh, mental health, of course, conditions. And so we, from 2001, we go to 2010. 10 years later, the, Z the Zadroga Act was finally uh, being established. And so that was very important because at that point, the program, the health program was funded 10 years later. It took a lot of action from uh, uh, unions and, uh, and doctors and a lot of forces to have that finally established. And uh, now the program, it's called World Trade Center Health Program, is funded for, is funded, is, uh, is confirmed for uh, many years. And, uh, and anyways, uh, I have a picture here of John Stewart, who was a conductor of a very important uh, TV show. He was a really strong advocate and it was very helpful to have the law signed on uh, December 2010, if I, if I remember correctly. And then, then victim compensa compensa compensation fund, an additional way to uh, come up with benefit for the workers. And so these are all legislative action that will have been very, very important in, for this program. Uh, here is the program and you can see there's a, I'm, I'm very sorry I can use, not use this, but anyways, see for example, COVID-19 updates here, <laughs> obviously responders having already respiratory conditions more vulnerable to COVID, so uh, uh, overlapping problems with the COVID. And this is anyways a program with different uh, languages, of course Spanish, a lot of the responders speak Spanish, 
uh, Polish, uh, Chinese, Mandarin, and other, uh, not many Tanyas, but, and many languages that, 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 and the call center that has to deal with different uh, communication. So the pro what, what is this program about? Uh, basically the program does two things. Uh, you can see here, epidemiological surveillance. What does that mean? All these uh, responders, you will see the number in a minute, more than 100,000 at the moment, it's a big number. They have to come for an annual visit, an annual examination to collect data about their health. So that is a way to keep the track of their health every year, more or less. Uh, they don't come so often, but anyways, this is a program. And the program always uh, uh, pays for treatment. Treatment of what? Of diseases that can be considered as World Trade Center related. So that's a way to compensate for an occupational disease similar to it, where there's a process, of course, to understand whether uh, this particular individual has a condition that can be related to the export. At that point, the program takes care of the treatment as well, and we're also talking about cancer treatment. So it's a, a lot of money. Uh, anyways, uh, there's data centers, the clinical, clinical center of excellence, there's clinical points where they can go for all these activities. And this is, a, and this is basically the program. Uh, there is also funding for research. This is research specific to this cohort. It's a very enormous cohort. There's a, a lot of different health aspects. So it's possible to apply for dedicated funds to do research on uh, the World Trade Center Health Program. Uh, okay, and uh, here's the structure, Clinical Center of, of Excellence, where they go for their uh, clinical activity. Data center, very important, they collect all the data. Outreach, fundamental, to keep the communication with all the members. And a World Trade Center Steering Committee, which is a kind of a committee that keeps together all forces, unions and uh, and uh, uh, the, the CDC NIOSH, which is the, the way where uh, the government funds the program through CDC NIOSH. So CDC NIOSH is, is, the, is the important uh, um, engine of all this and, uh, and, uh, and, and groups of interest and doctors, etc. So the World Trade Center Steering Committee is very important for that. There's another body which is, interest in, uh, which is important, which is the STAC Committee, Scientific Technical Advisory Committee. This is an interesting co uh, concept. This is a kind of a structure that absorbs all the um, evidence from research and translates that operationally. So what does that mean? There's research going on, trying to understand what are the long-term, now because years later, the long-term impacts of the exposure. If research is strong enough to provide evidence for to consider as exposure related some new condition, uh, this, this is what the uh, committee does, evaluates the uh, level of evidence and that if the evidence is considered sufficient, then it translates into uh, policy and, and uh, policy in this case, it means, okay, this is a new condition, we think this is exposure related, therefore everybody developing a disease like this on this condition can be paid by the program. Uh, these are the numbers you can see. Responders and survivors. Responders is more, is more than, than 80,000 at the moment. They can still enroll. This is an open access program. They can enroll uh, and so it's growing. Uh, and the survivors are those who survived from 9-11 but also the residents, those who were living in South Manhattan. So totally, with, at, there's an estimate of about a half million people, including the workers and the people who were living uh, at, uh, at Ground Zero. And, uh, okay, we will skip this. So the, the responders were firefighters, police officers, medical personnel, but also welders, electricians, construction workers, etc., etc. And so a very composite uh, workforce that was, was there. And uh, we see here the most important health conditions that are uh, uh, basically happening in the cohort. We have chronic rhinosinusitis, upper uh, airways, of course, were impacted. GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, because of the inhalation of a very irritant dust, also for the GI tract. 
cancers, asthma, sleep apnea, PTSD, uh, anxiety, depression, etc. So a mix of uh, physical and mental health condition, basically. Uh, okay, let's skip this up. The age of the cohort, of course, uh, they are aging. Uh, it's, uh, it's, up, it's actually about 55 years, the median, uh, the median age of the cohort. So it's, uh, it's aging as well. And this is an important factor. There are men, but also women in the cohort. And then uh, here there's some research uh, that is coming out on uh, updates about uh, uh, respiratory condition. Uh, what happened here? So, but anyways, you can see these graphs here very quickly. The red line is actually the part of the responders that were at very high exposure. And you can see that the red line is actually deteriorating more than the others. The others are those who were considered as lower exposure. And you can see also for asthma, the trend for sinusitis, for G, uh, for GERD. And so we can see these trends very clearly. These are the studies about cancer showing prostate, thyroid, leukemia, and all cancers combined actually significantly uh, higher than the expected. You can see uh, that there's some relationship with the exposure response for prostate and thyroid. So they, it's not that this easy because we don't really have exposure data, uh, but we do what we can. Uh, and there's some uh, understanding of those responses well for cancer. Uh, but now this is new. This is a dementia. A lot of these workers are showing uh, cognitive uh, problems. And uh, we believe that uh, there were a lot of neurotoxicants in that mix. So that, th 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 this is not, this is kind of, kind of justified biologically by the fact that there were neurotoxicants in that exposure mix. So that can be, this can be a long-term effect on the cognitive side, not only on the mental health side. So emerging cognitive impairment, basically, and then uh, basically this is my update about the 9-11 story. But after 9-11, then of course, unfortunately, we had other episodes. Beirut, Lebanon, August 2020. Miami Beach, Florida, June 2021. And Durban, South Africa, July 2021. Let's see a little bit uh, about this more recent uh, events. Beirut uh, was an explosion in the port. There was uh, uh, ammonium nitrate, a lot of it that exploded, so people died and many were injured, and uh, an explosion that uh, actually, unfortunately, didn't really have a good emergency response plan. That was very unfortunate. And up to now, there is no follow-up of emergency response. Workers in the impacted community, there's no such a health uh, program like for the, the one for the 9-11, not, not even a similar one. Uh, Miami Beach, Florida, uh, the tower collapsed, Obviously, the magnitude was not the same as 9-11, but you can still see the same pictures of the workers actually wearing helmet, now wearing respiratory. It's, it's always a fight to have them wear uh, the mask. We can, we can have a little discussion about this, uh, hopefully later on. Uh, but this time we had sensors. Years later, we have a lot of devices that we can place on site to collect exposure data that are very important. I'm with I'm one minute, I know. <laughs> uh, and it was possible to track everybody with this code so that uh, everybody was uh, identified on site and this was an improvement. South Africa, another uh, fire of chemicals. In this case, again, no, day, no data, no systematic health assessment. The company was not even, uh, uh, not even in providing information about the 700 different chemicals that were burning. So, terrible story. And then uh, I would like to close with this. This is a, a white paper that we wrote uh, in 2017. And actually, you, all the authors you can see there, they were colleagues who worked uh, on uh, the major uh, chemical and occupational and industrial disaster, uh, starting from Seveso, Italy, to Bhopal, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and 9-11, and uh, it was important to have all of them participating. Interestingly, there were colleagues from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine working together for that, uh, uh, for that uh, white paper. 
Uh, so these are basically the points that I would like to make uh, available for discussion here. Lesson learned, who know who was on the site, collect exposure data immediately, have public health input into the disaster response, take care of the affected with this health program that you have seen, data-driven analysis, collect the data, and advocacy, very, very important. So thank you for your attention, and uh, hopefully we'll come and have some discussion. Thank you very much, Roberto, and thank you for introducing the topics for the discussion afterwards. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, so in the interest of time, we'll move on directly to, to Thierry uh, to talk about radiological disasters, please. So the next presentation. Okay, so thank you and good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I will try to do my best to make a review of some of the challenges associated with uh, preparedness and response to nuclear accident, but in 15 minutes that will be difficult. And I uh, will uh, encourage you to check uh, notably the Shamisen report who uh, really emphasized some key elements with regard to health uh, preparedness. So, uh, having said that, uh, so, first of all, I would like to emphasize some few points concerning the lessons from experience, and notably, uh, unfortunately, from the Chernobyl and Fukushima accident, who really uh, put uh, some key stress on the, the, the response and recovery uh, from nuclear disaster. The, the key points that we can uh, first emphasize from these two accidents is that uh, after uh, this type of accident, people are lost. They no longer trust the authority and the expert, which is something quite challenging for, for uh, uh, experts uh, addressing this topic. And in fact, they gradually lose the control of their daily life and there is finally a street on, on their dignity. So beyond uh, all the direct health aspect, there is some key element to be considered, and we have seen that also for, from the previous uh, presentation. The other point is that the return to the ante situation, which is something that uh, all the people can expect, is uh, generally not possible. First of all, uh, with radioactivity, uh, we have uh, uh, an impossibility to retrieve all uh, the radioactivity. You still have some background into the environment. Is it dangerous or not? Uh, this is a key question. Is it safe or not? This is a key question. There is also some uh, human and societal consequences which are irreversible. Uh, after the accident, you have people who, who, who leave, uh, who left the, the area, and you have also disruption of the community that finally uh, induce rupture and complex dilemma. Even inside the family, uh, there are some key elements to be considered. Then, the socio-economic dynamics, if we discuss about resilience and recovery, this is confronted to an altered context with new constraints. The demography is not ever the same, the image of the area is not the same, the environment is not the same, and so on. Then, with regard to radiological protection, we may have some good uh, proposal uh, with regard to how to protect radiation. In fact, the respect of radiological protection standard is not enough uh, to rebuild confidence of people in the recovery process. And there is a need to rebuild uh, social trust and that requires to involve uh, people and rely on direct relationships uh, between stakeholders. So this is a key element that we have learned from uh, this experience. There is a need to respect individual choices and to involve uh, them with a perspective to improve uh, the living condition in the working, uh, in the affected areas. So I will not go too much in detail, but this is something which has been largely developed uh, following these two accidents. The timeline for managing uh, a, a nuclear accident, so you have of course, a question of preparedness. I will come back uh, later on that. But then, as soon as you have the accident, you have an early phase where there is discussion because sometimes the, the discharge, the release into the environment is not just at the time of the accident. So you have some 
sometimes uh, you have uh, an emergency to, to, to be managed. Then you have the intermediate phase. I will come back on that where you, you have to characterize the situation. You have to understand and to intervene and set up some protective action. And then you have long-term phase. And one of the key points is that uh, after the Chernobyl accident, we had in mind that it should be uh, possible to come back uh, very quickly to uh, more secure situation. But in fact, uh, we, we see that it's a matter of several years, several decades, uh, and even after the uh, 30 years, more than 35 years after the Chernobyl accident, there is still some stress on, on the management of, of the consequences of the accident. So briefly, some characteristic of the early and intermediate phase. The early phase is when you, you need to take uh, urgent action to avoid or mitigate in, indesirable exposure. That means, first of all, you have to consider evacuation and or sheltering of the population. You have the iodine uh, thyroid blocking, which is a quite sensitive issue for a nuclear accident. But then you have a restriction of local food and water supply, and also something which have not been uh, observed significantly after the Chernobyl, but more uh, stressy after the Fukushima accident, the protection of pets and, and livestock, which finally it's not something so simple uh, when you have some large uh, areas affected by uh, contamination. Then when the radiological situation become, uh, becomes available uh, during the intermediate phase, you need to uh, consider uh, furthermore what is behind that. And I've seen some uh, similarity with COVID when you have to characterize the situation and then you can modify the geographic, geographical and uh, uh, the temporal spread of initial protective action. You may uh, introduce some new uh, relocation. You may uh, adapt uh, the agriculture or the economic activity. And you have to question what will be the future uh, of uh, uh, this uh, um, economic and social activity in, in the affected areas. Then moving from the intermediate phase to the long-term phase, uh, this is something uh, quite uh, <laughs> quite stressy and uh, challenging uh, because the decision uh, by the authority to allow people to leave permanently or to come back uh, should be taken in close consultation with local community and other stakeholders. And then this is where science and policy need to work together uh, because there is, it's, there is no magic number. You may uh, propose some uh, good, uh, um, good radiological criteria from the scientific point of view where you consider that there is no major uh, concern for health issue, but then it's not enough. And then there is a need to characterize the radiological situation of the environment, the food stuff, uh, the goods and, and also the people, of course. You have to set up mechanism in order to involve uh, the stakeholder at the local level uh, in the decision-making processes, uh, to provide them some uh, means to organize the radiological monitoring. And the radiological monitoring means, of course, the environment, uh, the measurement of individual for external and internal doses, but of course, all the health management survey, which is quite important to be considered. And then one element which have been uh, uh, which have been developed after the Chernobyl accident and which have been uh, reinforced after the Fukushima accident is what we call the co-expertise process uh, to put in place uh, with uh, in, uh, people involved involved in affected area, uh, affected area, which means that uh, I will come back on that, but which means that. The, the, you, you have to work uh, together uh, with uh, experts, the economic actors, the social actors, the stakeholders, the authority in order to see what could be uh, the future. And of course, one key element, and we, we have seen that after the COVID, the key element is the basic right to decide about the future, uh, but then taking into account the different components. The characteristic uh, of the long-term phase uh, this is something where, in fact, uh, is quite challenging because there is no, not only uh, collective uh, protective measures, but then the individual behavior is quite in important in order to ensure the protection. 
And then uh, you, you have to consider uh, how people will interact according to their location, according to their professional occupation, but also to their individual habits. And then it's why it's quite uh, significant to really involve uh, the people uh, as soon as possible in order to achieve a, a good level of protection. Then we may observe large differences in the level of exposure. Uh, we may have vulnerable population. We may even inside the family, you may have significant differences. And then you, you may uh, consider that you can calculate the average exposure level, but then you have, you have to take a key uh, consideration of the distribution of individual exposure, and then to see that you have a few individuals who can receive larger exposures than the average. Then we, we try to formalize uh, more recently the co-expertise process with uh, the key role of uh, dialogue with a key role of uh, uh, engaging affected people in measurements and in sharing the result and interpreting the result and to identify uh, the self-help protective action and organizing the collective vigilance. The last point which is quite important with regard to that is how to implement local projects because in order to, uh, to, to ensure the recovery uh, of the situation, you need to see what could be the new future of the people and in which way the social and economic activity could be rebuilt uh, according to the current situation. So then uh, dialogue, measure, measurement and local projects are quite important with regard to that. <clears throat> so some consideration for preparedness. Uh, I will not expand too much, but uh, the, the first element is to have a pre-planned protection strategy and to work on uh, different scenarios. Uh, and then it's quite important to, uh, to challenge uh, these different uh, scenarios with all the people. There is a need to emphasize with regard to the longer term uh, aspect, what could be the vulnerability of potentially affected areas. Depending on the affected area uh, of the socio-economic structure of the area, uh, there may uh, be a different uh, type of action uh, to be considered, and there is a need to develop guidelines which are sufficiently flexible. Uh, you cannot predict everything in advance, but you need to have some general framework uh, in order to be able to cope with the situation when, uh, when you are facing to a specific aspect. Then, a key point for preparedness with regard to uh, nuclear accident is, first of all, to consider uh, that uh, there is a possibility that a nuclear accident could occur. This is a, a key element, and this is not so simple because uh, in the nuclear sector, the role of most of the people is to ensure the safety of the situation, and, and then you have to acknowledge that there is a failure. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, all these uh, preparedness need to be uh, work as much as possible. You cannot work with all uh, the people, but you have to work with key representative of stakeholders. Then I try to, in conclusion, to uh, identify some generic uh, challenges. The first element, uh, which seems to be uh, similar with nuclear and other aspects, is the management of uncertainty and the consideration of the long-term dynamics. Uh, there is a role, key role for risk assessment and modeling in this perspective. There is a key role of how to provide information which could be useful for decision makers. Then there is a need to balance protective uh, action with preservation of socioeconomic activities. If, if you want to, uh, to preserve the future, then sometimes you need to accept that people could work uh, in some condition which are not uh, the maximum protective action. There is a key role of stakeholder involvement with dialogue, with monitoring and risk characterization, and also to involve them in uh, the implementation of protective action. And we can see that uh, with the COVID clearly, uh, that people need to be uh, 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 directly implement, uh, actors in, in, the prote in the protection. There is a key role of radiological protection culture, first of all for transparency and access to information, to develop skills for people to, to understand what, what is at stake and the ability to interpret the result because when people discover that you have 
uh, one millisievert that you have uh, 300 becquerel per kilogram, it doesn't mean anything. So you need really to have the ability to interpret uh, and, to, and to do that. And for that, the health and education staff are, que are key uh, actors to, to develop the radiological protection culture. Then there is also a key role of governance articulating local, national, and international level with adequate coordination. There is an importance of regaining trust, I, I mentioned that uh, at the beginning, and of course, some due consideration, I had no time to develop that on ethical values, uh, with a global objective to restore decent and living condition, and then uh, to consider resilience and sustainable development. And then for that, we may consider the prudence with regard to the potential impact on the future. Some question of justice, how far you can uh, interact with uh, uh, special, special diff different uh, community, but also to consider the future uh, generation. The question of autonomy and dignity, and then a series of uh, value like accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, and empathy. There is also a large mobilization of economic resources to cope with the uh, altered situation. We have seen the question of compensation, which is quite important. Reorganizing the socio-economic activity where there is no specific return to the ante situation. And then in conclusion, uh, we can mention that the promotion of well-being is strongly linked with the rehabilitation of decent and sustainable living condition. Such rehabilitation need to consider a long-term vision uh, of the territory and the affected community. What does it mean and how to involve uh, the key uh, stakeholders? And then we have key challenge to foster resilience and, uh, of individual and community preparedness. And we, we have in mind uh, to rely on all hazard approach. And of course, uh, with regard to nuclear, we are thinking of uh, implementing the UN framework for the disaster risk reduction uh, adopted in, in Sunday. So I'm sorry, this is just a, a first re review of some element, but uh, I'm seeing that there are some key elements that we can uh, share with uh, the other situation. And then at, at the end, you, you can see some references. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thierry. Uh, it was very, very informative. Um, I think in the interest of time, so that we have discussion in the end, we'll just move directly to the next presentation, uh, which is an online presentation by Claire Horwell. Um, I don't know how this works. Claire, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here, and I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, thank you. So Claire uh, is from Durham University in the International Volcanic Health Hazards Network, and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Okay, so I can hear my voice very clearly coming through your speakers, which is very distracting. Ah, uh, can you, uh, I don't know how to do this. So you're hearing yourself speak. Yes. Um, can you um, mute your speakers? <laughs> while you're speaking. Yep. Well, I don't know what's... Are you, Sorry, are, are you using to... the same source as uh, for your microphone and your speaker, or are you using two different sources, which would explain why you would hear yourself? Okay, I'm going to mute my laptop, and then can you tell me if you can still hear me, please? Can you still hear me? Yes. Thumbs up. Okay, I'm going to speak like this. Uh, my laptop's completely muted. Um, <laughs> please let me know if there's any problem. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Claire Howell. I'm a professor at Durham University in the Institute of Hazard Risk and Resilience and the Department of Earth Sciences. And I'm the director of the International Volcanic Health Hazard Network. So today I'm going to speak about PR3 strategies for volcanic crisis response. The first thing I wanted to say is um, that I'm a firm believer that the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction is correct in saying that there is no such thing as a natural disaster 
only a natural hazard. So already today we've mentioned the term natural disasters several times and it's also in the programme. But um, in fact, disasters really happen to societies and um, the potential for a disaster to happen de depends extremely on the um, the society's resilience and uh, stage of development. And so we mustn't assume that just because a natural hazard occurs that it is going to be a disaster for the people living there. And that's something that I want to bear in mind when we think about PR3 responses. So for those of you who aren't that familiar with volcanic eruptions, um, unlike some other kinds of natural hazards, volcanoes tend to produce many kinds of hazards simultaneously during an eruptive event. And to simplify this, um, on this cartoon you can see here, we have um, all of the hazards really shown on one diagram. They're very unlikely to all happen at the same time or even at the same eruption or volcano, but we can categorize them generally into ground-based hazards, which are often earthquakes or different types of flows, um, as you can see uh, in this part of the diagram. And these tend to lead to injuries and fatalities. And then we have another category of hazards, which are the airborne hazards, which for the most part result from a plume of volcanic ash or gas. Uh, and it's an airborne hazard that tends to then affect communities by causing respiratory or other symptoms or potentially diseases, which is what we're very concerned about, people inhaling the ash and, and uh, diseases occurring. So we have a lot to think about when a volcano starts to um, erupt or show signs of unrest, thinking about the various hazards that could affect a community. And it depends very much on where the community is in relation to the volcano. So um, this is an adaptation of uh, a volcano emergency management cycle. Um, we tend to have four phases, and that's because we count the period uh, prior to any eruption as pre-unrest, but we could consider the volcano to be dormant at this stage. Uh, we then have an unrest phase. So generally a volcano will give us some warning that it's going to erupt. And that gives us a little time to get everything in order and prepare for a response. So then we have the volcanic event itself. Now, unlike an earthquake, this is not necessarily over in a matter of seconds. A volcanic event could continue for hours, days, weeks, and sometimes years. So it's not entirely clear when we might start to move into the recovery or post-event phase. Um, and the post-event phase then merges back into the pre-unrest phase. But in, in this case, I'm going to consider this as immediately post-event. So thinking about preparedness and resilience, uh, we tend to build these in the pre-unrest uh, uh, phase primarily. And I've listed on the side here some of the key activities that in an ideal world would be happening in the society that's close to a volcano. So this would be the time when we're conducting hazard, vulnerability and risk assessments. Um, hazard assessments at a volcano mean studying previous deposits, trying to understand the volcano's previous behavior and what it might do in the future. This is also the time when we would set up volcano monitoring so that we know if the volcano is entering a period of unrest. Also, uh, the local government should be looking at land use planning and trying to ensure that um, infrastructure and houses are not built in the path of the volcanic flows that might come. Um, emergency planning also happens during this period, of course, we hope, um, and also a whole suite of mitigating actions. Now, this might be related to land use or, you know, building bridges over valleys to avoid um, infrastructure cutoff when there's a flow, but it could also be much more related to health. And in my case, this means developing uh, informational products and uh, uh raising awareness in communities and talking to stakeholders about how they're going to respond to the um, eruption and how they're going to protect the communities who are going to be exposed. This is also the time when we develop communication systems, warning and alert systems. Uh, we set in place educational programs and we also build stakeholder re um, relations with local communities and uh, with um, governmental and agency um, stakeholders. 
So at the point where a volcano starts to show unrest, uh, we then move into the next phase where we obviously continue with the volcano monitoring and the analysis of these precursory signals. This will allow us to start to uh, develop some sort of model and prediction of when the volcano may erupt. Uh, communication at this stage is absolutely critical at all levels. And this is also when we refine the details of an emergency response. So, you know, is there syndromic surveillance in place? Uh, does it contain the outcome measures that might uh, occur from uh, a volcanic eruption, particularly related to respiratory health? Um, is there epidemiology? Can we set up studies? Is there airborne air quality monitoring, etc.? So we might have a few weeks to set that all up. Um, we then move into the event itself, if it happens. Sometimes a volcano never erupts, even though it showed unrest. We continue with the volcano monitoring, we continue with the communication, but then obviously there are huge decisions to be made with great societal impact related to whether to evacuate people and how to do that safely, how to maintain quality of life during that period, etc. Syndromic surveillance will be triggered. Uh, this may include or follow on with epidemiological studies if the volcanic event is prolonged. Hopefully air quality monitoring will be put in place. Often it just is not available. So this is an idealized situation. And also geochemical and toxicological analyses may be put in place to analyze the ash to look for its immediate health hazard and threat. And finally, we move into community protection, looking at um, not just evacuation, but how to protect people from airborne exposures to volcanic ash, uh, appropriate use of um, respirators, etc. Hopefully at some point we move into the post-event recovery phase and we have to continue with the volcano monitoring because actually it may not be over. We have to continue with the air quality monitoring because there will be a lot of remobilization of ash and also um, gases can continue to be emitted from a volcano for many years after an eruption has finished. This is the point where recovery assessments have to take place. Is it safe to move people back into areas which were, have been severely affected? What kind of rebuilding is required, etc.? Communication is clearly critical during this time, and there may be continuing long-term epidemiological and clinical assessment if, there is, if it's been a prolonged eruption and there is thought that there could be chronic um, health issues in the communities. So how do we actually go about this in volcanic eruptions? Well, in 2003, so almost 20 years ago, I set up the International Volcanic Health Hazard Network. And I did this initially to bring together the various disciplines involved in volcano health research. So everything across all the medical disciplines and also the volcanological disciplines, exposure science, et cetera. But over the years, we have evolved into an international organization which helps governments uh, prepare um, and NGOs prepare for eruptions. We provide public health information. We provide crisis response protocols and advice. And we also provide analytical services, for example, air quality monitoring and volcanic ash analysis. So one of the first steps when we're trying to start the preparation for a health response to an eruption is to bring the experts together. And the first volcano health response actually took place at Mount St. Helens in 1980 uh, in the USA. And in recent years, we've been working with the original uh, team at the Centers for Disease Control in the US uh, to try and learn the lessons of um, that eruption response, which was really a remarkable response coordinated across a whole range of disciplines and to try and um, learn those lessons and to actually be prepared to enact those kinds of responses in the future. Um, we held a workshop in San Francisco in uh, December 2019. You can see some of the original team here. Some of them are now in their 80s. Um, and we're now currently working with the new CDC team and also across many other e um, US agencies who have become involved in the large US eruption to try and prepare because there are so many different aspects to the response that is not something that can easily be drawn together in a crisis, although they managed it in 1980. The second step is to design, test and enact protocols. This enables a rapid response if you already have your protocols set up and they can just be taken off the shelf. 
but also it gives uh, an opportunity to standardize methods in different eruption scenarios um, so that you can start to build an evidence base and compare across locations. Um, we are still year, we are now years since Mount St. Helens and we still have problems really understanding how volcanoes behave and how communities are affected around the world due to a lack of standardized methodologies. So what you see on this slide is a standardized protocol for rapid analysis of volcanic ash through geochemical and toxicological assessment. Um, there are many different methods here. We employ some of them depending on the style of eruption. And we have designed these protocols. We have tested the methods and published the methods. And then we've also enacted the protocols during crises. And you can see an example of a published paper here. So those are geochemical and toxicological um, protocols for rapid assessment, but we also wanted to have off the shelf epidemiological protocols. Um, many uh, epidemiological studies have now been conducted at volcanoes around the world, but they often miss the critical period of highest exposures at eruption onset. And this is because the study methods are still being developed or the ethical approval hasn't come through, et cetera. So we, we actually have very little understanding of the impact of eruptions on acute and chronic um, health, particularly respiratory health. And so in, in response, we developed two standardized epidemiological protocols. Um, these are published uh, in the bulletin of the World Health Organization and on our website. And um, some of you might recognize some names here. We have Ciro Ugarte, who's speaking later today um, from the Pan American Health Organization. So these were developed um, together with um, agencies and with local actors to make sure that they would be relevant in as many locations and situations as possible. Um, the basic protocol assesses the respiratory and other health impacts from acute exposures, and the cross-sectional protocol assesses, oh, assesses the extent to which volcanic exposures cause adverse respiratory and other health effects. The protocols advise relatively simple and inexpensive methods, which is absolutely critical when you have crises happening in all kinds of um, economic, economic situations. Uh, we've tried to design them to be applicable in all volcanic contexts, regardless of resource availability or the health record systems. Um, and we've gone through a process with workshops of testing the protocols um, in, in local situations. Um, consistent use, we hope, will generate a strong and comparable evidence base of the health impacts of eruptions. So I also mentioned how important communication is. Um, yeah. Communities can become extremely anxious about the impacts of eruptions. Um, if you're breathing in ash all the time, it's in your face, it's in your nose and in your mouth, you will be very concerned about whether it's safe to actually breathe um, with all these particles in the air. So we have designed a suite of informational products um, for the public. Some of these have actually been designed with the public themselves. So they've been co-designed to make sure that they are as applicable as possible and will be taken up by the local communities. Um, some of these, the ones that I can, you can see on the screen here, were co-designed and um, uh, ratified by the Pan American Health Organization, as you can see with the logos here. And we've designed products at different levels for different needs. So, for example, posters, which can be uh, contain very basic information, can be put on bulletin boards, booklets, which have a lot more information and you know very detailed information, and also leaflets that, for example, can be handed out with face masks to show um, immediately how to safely fit a face mask. And these were designed pre-COVID times, but have been used extensively during COVID by communities wanting to know how to fit face masks properly. There's also a suite of videos which accompany these printable products. And finally, stakeholder engagement. Um, we couldn't do any of this without working with stakeholders at the community level, local agencies, both governmental and non-governmental, and at the national level. And we have commitments from some agencies to either distribute IVHHN communication products during eruptions or to use the protocols in future eruption crises. And you can see some of these uh, key stakeholders for IVHHN here. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen if I can work out how. And I'll unmute one second so I can hear you. 
Okay, hi. Right. Comprehensive and uh, clear uh, talk. A a any quick question? Yes, Marta. Uh, could you have a microphone, please? Yeah. Just a, a very simple question. What is the legal, uh, is it a legal entity, the IVHHN? Is it informal? Does it, who funds it? C could you explain a bit? Yeah. That's an excellent question. I'm sorry, I'm having problems on sharing my screen. So if, if someone can do that at your end, that would be great. I can't see, it, it seems to have disappeared. Anyway, um, yeah, so IVHHN is not a formal entity. Uh, we are basically a group of academics and people working, for example, for the United States Geological Survey, um, who have experience in different aspects of volcano health. Um, so there are a few of us who've dedicated our careers to this and work in a very interdisciplinary way. And we are the people that are leading this. And then we tend to bring in disciplinary experts when we need them. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to climate change. Uh, thanks. Ah, now we see you. <laughs> yeah. We didn't see you before. Okay. I'm so sorry. I finally worked out how to do it. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Jaroslav Misiak uh, from Venezia, uh, from the European Euro Mediterranean Center on uh, Climatic Change. Jaroslav? Good morning, Gala. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, could you please confirm that you see correctly my screen in the full uh, yes. presentation mode? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jaro Misiak. I'm working at Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. Uh, I'm a research director uh, leading the division on risk assessment and adaptation strategies. Um, and I, I, I would love to be with you, but uh, my daughter was tested positive on COVID uh, and I'm in self-imposed uh, isolation. So uh, you probably didn't want to have me in there. Um, in the current situation. So the climate change is not a hazard per se, but it's a amplifying driver of, uh, of many existing uh, uh, threats and hazards. Um, there's a few months ago, uh, the IPCC released the six assessment report, that, uh, uh, especially the working group two is focusing on the impact on health. Uh, that's the chapter seven just to make it easier for you. So there is a, a new evidence and a really robust evidence about how climate change uh, influences human well-being and health. And uh, uh, you know, for the first time in more extensive way, uh, the assessment report also covered the mental health challenges that includes anxiety, stress, and post-traumatic stress order, um, which is very interesting read reading. But rather than, you know, uh, uh, the climate change having its, uh, its own uh, um, health impact, it really um, it goes with, uh, with the extreme climate events, with uh, environmental degradation, with, uh, with uh, um, dislocation or, um, or forced uh, migration and so on, with uh, environmental impacts and so on. So it's quite the, you know, uh, a very broad range of impact and uh, impact pathways that climate change might might have. Sorry, Miroslav, let me inter uh, interrupt you for one second. We don't see your screen anymore. Now you see you. I don't know. Were, were you sharing the screen? Yes, I am. Uh, could you try to share it again, please? I don't know what's happening. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Can you see it now? No, we see you. We don't see your screen. What? Do we have it the, must, do we have it must your be, slides here? It must be the problem on your side, not on mine, because Ella, Ella, you might visualize my. Uh, we, we were seeing it and it stopped all of a sudden. I'm sorry for, for this. They are saying online. They are seeing it. Ah. People okay, people online are seeing it. So hopefully we exactly. can. So it's on. It's, on, a, it's, it's projecting here. So why don't you continue while we try to. Projected for ourselves here too. Okay. Uh, just one, one second. Sorry. Yeah, Eli. Okay, because the people online see the presentation. No, no, no. 
All right. Okay, sorry, we, we will share it from here. Just one second. Sorry. So I can also switch off my video camera. You see, automatically you should see uh, the slides, right? No, uh, no, no, no. No, they're, they're, we're going to share it from here in, in one second. I don't know. Sorry about that. Eli, do you have it? The joys of hybrid meetings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> although after two years, we have some experience in doing that. Yeah. Yes? Okay, which slide do we start on, Miroslav? I'm on the slide two. On slide two, please. We don't see it. Uh, okay. Uh, Eli, we don't see it on those two screens. <laughs> okay, go, go ahead, Miroslav. Yeah. So, um, so le, in addition to IPCC assessment report six, so, uh, uh, there's another panel, which is an international panel for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And they have uh, produced a special report on biodiversity and pandemics. And it uh, highlights that the underlying causes and pandemics are the same. Um, then uh, uh, the ones have global environmental change, including environmental change. And this is uh, basically through biodiversity loss and uh, land use changes, agriculture expansion, intensification, wildfire trade and consumption and so on. So that it's interesting to, uh, to look at uh, the climate change as a part of the uh, global environmental change that includes also how we degrade the uh, environment. I'm moving to slide three. Next slide. Please. And speaking about nature and environment, uh, we know that ecosystems uh, can help to mitigate uh, natural hazards and, uh, and increase societal resilience locally or regionally. And this was uh, the, uh, the recognition of this uh, has given rise to uh, uh, a large program promoting the nature-based solution. Nature-based solutions are inspired by nature, uh, offer cost-efficient uh, uh, solutions can be combined with non-nature solutions like gray infrastructure, but uh, they are more effective and they are more, uh, more cost-efficient um, uh, in many, uh, many uh, senses. Nature-based solution can uh, help to reduce vulnerability and increase the resilience. So there's a large, in, speaking in terms of uh, bringing the community together, there's a large uh, mobilization of uh, different uh, UN agencies, NGOs, governments, uh, funders, seller sponsors, and so on, behind nature-based solutions. One uh, stream of those, uh, of that community is focusing on nature-based solution in humanitarian context. And uh, that's a, a, a shared uh, initiative of Pedro Feba and other institutions uh, working on nature-based solution. I, I have included the, the um, link to the key document, how to promote the nature and nature-based solution in order to reduce the impact of extreme climate-related events, uh, including the biological hazards. And speaking a little bit uh, uh, under the head of, as a member of scientific committee of European Environment Agency, uh, the EEA has an interesting uh, climate and health observatory, which is again a joint uh, initiative with the European Commission. And it uh, uh, offers uh, an easy access, one stop uh, entry point to a number of uh, indicators and information about the health impact and climate change. And uh, in addition to that, uh, shortly there will be an environmental health atlas, which will, will go online later this year, uh, which is uh, a communication tool that presents the information and environmental health across Europe. And you might use that to combine the information and uh, uh, establish your own risk profile. I'm moving now to, uh, to slide four. So what is the, um, uh, there's been a um, uh, uh, great advance of uh, computational power and the numerical algorithm that enabled a large scale climate risk assessment. So we are able to model the flood risk heat waves. We are able to simulate the climate change almost at a kilometer scale. Um, 
using regional climate model or, or even uh, uh, you know the global climate model are uh, getting down to similar scales and this is the vision where we move to so uh, thanks to this technological advance uh, we are able to simulate, provide simulation of how the climate changes and uh, like how, what the implication might be uh, in different sectors and in different uh, policy areas. Um, this is the hazard. On the hazard side, uh, the advancement uh, has been great. On the, on the side of uh, exposure, um, we have socioeconomic uh, uh, pathways, a uh, uh, set of scenarios that explain how the world more develop, and uh, this is used together with uh, with the hazard information in order to um, to project the risk into the future. What we are less um, able to do is to model and project the vulnerability. That means how the different agencies or people will be able to cope with the uh, climate change and extreme climate related events. So as an example of this initiative, how, how all this information is combined and used for practical purposes, there is an um, international partnership uh, which, is, which is called Inform uh, Risk, and it includes UN agencies, includes uh, European Commission services, includes NGOs and research organizations. And, the, uh, and this uh, multi-stakeholder forum um, have agreed on a way how to assess the climate risk for humanitarian assistance. And Allah, this, this group has developed the, the methodology to assess um, the risk, to project that into the future, and to use this information to prioritize uh, humanitarian assistance that comes from uh, multiple We've lost you. <laughs> Sorry, can you still hear me? Because yes, yes, I'm now, yes, yes. Uh, receiving some messages from the organizer. Yeah, okay, now yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, as an impractical example, how to use this uh, shared framework uh, for um, assessing the humanitarian risk. Uh, uh, we have uh, developed the informed climate indicator, and that means basically from the agreed standard and protocol for uh, assessing climate-related risk for humanitarian purposes. Uh, we have uh, singled out the climate-amplified uh, hazards and projected them into the future, and we have used uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, the socioeconomic uh, pathways, uh, the, the scenarios have how the society might develop and the, the early, um, early projections of vulnerability in order to quantify, for example, how many people will be forced uh, to leave their houses, uh, how many people will be affected in different ways and, uh, and use that in anticipation of, uh, for planning of humanitarian assistance, including the the health assistance, uh, the food assistance, and uh, post-disaster recovery. So this is an example how we use the uh, climate risk information in order to um, to inform uh, practical policy making. Because all the funding, for example, the European Union and the EU member states, uh, uh, they funds provided for humanitarian aid are uh, governed using this methodology. So this is one example. Um, there are a number of, uh, uh, of others, uh, other similar tools that we are using, uh, for example, the Inform Severity Index. Rather than looking at the whole probability distribution, um, we look at specific events and look into how the, um, how the risk drivers, how the initial condition might be changed in order to simulate uh, how much worse the event might get in case of compound events or in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in case of concomitant uh, hazard strikes. And we have done that, uh, uh, for example, for the um, uh, tropical cyclone in Mozambique uh, um, in 2019, we reconstructed the, the um, climate extreme events, uh, uh, the tropical cyclone hitting the coast of Mozambique. Uh, causing uh, large devastation, also large uh, 
uh, impact on the population and economic damage. And we have combined that with other uh, uh, counterfactual information, for example, what might happen if the humanitarian access is blocked uh, or how the situation played out with or without the pandemic uh, situation. So these type of uh, simulation exercises are extremely useful to, uh, to get an overview about how the, um, how the similar disaster strike might evolve under different conditions in the future. This is a part of what we call uh, stress test disaster risk management capabilities. Uh, it's a part of uh, the procedure how to assess risk management uh, capabilities. Um, so I'm now moving to slide six. So you should see mission adaptation. And I, I reserved a uh, you know, couple of slides to, uh, to speak about this program, which is a large, uh, um, large uh, innovation program of European Union uh, that is supporting the European climate adaptation strategy. So because the climate change is a sort of uh, amplifier or single hazard, but also have this systemic uh, dimension and cutting across different economic sectors, almost all economic sectors and societies, the new European adaptation strategy has advocated for systemic, fast, and, uh, uh, and just adaptation. And uh, mission adaptation is a part of those efforts. It's mission-oriented research innovation as a part of the Horizon Europe, the EU Research Innovation Framework Program, sets out to help the communities and regions to look at uh, the impact of climate change from the systemic perspective, uh, to initiate a transformative journey that is committing the communities and regions to long-term sustainability, equity, social and gender justice, uh, but also a systemic uh, adaptation that includes the health uh, aspect, but within the uh, portfolio of all the other uh, linked uh, aspect like environment, like uh, economic, uh, local economies and so on. So mission adaptation is a new uh, innovation program that is open to all communities and regions in Europe. I have included the easy links how to access that. And the underlying uh, uh, journey behind the mission is a transformative pathway. And the transformative pathway start with uh, better screening and understanding of climate risk, but also the opportunities to accelerate the adaptation to those risks and uh, opportunities to transform in a sustainable way in order to, uh, to address not only the, uh, the impact of climate change, but really to address the root causes of economic and social and environmental um, um, uh, inequalities that, uh, that, that are characterizing climate change and contributing to the impacts. Um, what is interesting, uh, this mission adaptation, I was uh, uh, happy and lucky to, to be part of the expert team that designed the mission adaptation. Uh, they devised a uh, program that uh, focused on key community uh, uh, systems. And those key community systems are basically those that are most vulnerable to climate change and uh, they are most important for social cohesion at the, at the level at the low level like communities and regions and those key community systems include protection of human health and well-being um, social infrastructure um, restoring nature biodiversity and ecosystems uh, rethinking water management how we how we use water and how we respond to water related threats and uh, how we manage uh, rural landscapes and sustainable food programs so this is something uh, uh, that is an uh, uh, might demonstrate uh, the adaptation systemic adaptation across the different field in in uh, in a way that will uh, uh, interact across and build up on the opportunities and uh, synergies across those uh, policy areas. So uh, I'm sorry for all uh, those technical troubles. I hope you see my final uh, screen. This is take home messages. Uh, we know that the resilience uh, 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 has become a new compass. So, sorry, for Miroslav, we, we've really run out of time. Could you please wrap up? Uh, right, I'm you. on the last mm -hmm. slide. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 
uh, basically the challenges are uh, after we have uh, really advanced in modeling the climate risk and uh, um, and simulating also how we uh, how the exposure will evolve into the future the key aspect to understand better is the vulnerability how we can uh, better link that uh, um, with the health outcomes for example but not only and how to systematically monitor improvement and uh, uh, measures that uh, contribute to reducing the vulnerability. Um, so I stop here. Thank you very much again. Um, sorry for the technical troubles. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. This is, is uh, very, very interesting uh, approaches. And sorry for all the technical difficulties we've had. Um, we will get back to some of the topics in the general discussion. And our last talk is by Oliver Razum from Bielefeld, Uni Bielefeld University in Germany on uh, war and refugees, uh, a very topical uh, subject. Thank you. Oliver, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, my name is Oliver Razum. I'm dean of uh, Bielefeld School of Public Health. Um, I'm an epidemiologist and Sorry, medical Oliver, doctor. Sorry, Oliver, apparently your, your slides are not being shown right now. Oh, okay. Well, I haven't oh, started. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I haven't no, no, started. No, no, it's just because the, the, the screens in front of me are showing something different. Okay, sorry, go on. Okay. okay. So um, I'm uh, also um, a member of the executive board of ASFA, the Association of Schools of Public Health in Europe. I'll come back to this point in a second. And now I'm going to share my screen, which you should see now. Um, no. Uh, I think the online people should be able to see it. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, the online people see it, but we don't see it. But we're online, technically. What's, okay, yeah, we see it on one screen, no? Oh. Okay, I think we're going to be sharing it from here, if you don't mind. No problem at all. Yeah. All right, could we share it on all screens, please? That looks good. Yeah, great. So, I'm going to talk about refugee uh, migration, um, which of course, is a common event. Still, there is surprisingly low preparedness uh, in many European uh, health systems. If you recall that uh, there was a large influx of refugees from former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, the response in many countries was not to prepare the healthcare systems for similar uh, influxes um, in future uh, years but rather the Dublin agreements uh, were pushed as a kind of political solution in the sense um, that it became very difficult for refugees to reach many of the Western European countries, uh, the Northwestern European countries. In fact, most of them who crossed the Mediterranean uh, would be stuck in either Greece or Italy uh, due to this agreement. As a consequence of um, this uh, Dublin agreement and the lack of preparation, healthcare systems have a low level of uh, resilience with regard to refugee migration. It was quite amazing still how many refugees were taken care of in uh, the years after 2012 when refugee migration across the Mediterranean intensified, but this was quite often improvised. There was very little in terms of uh, health system resilience when it came to the transformative aspect, aspect, meaning again, preparing the system. So the question here is, is this due to a lack of political will? It's certainly not um, due to a lack of awareness among public health people. In terms of terminology, of course, refugees are not a hazard, um, as the PR3 uh, terminology might imply, but rather refugee migration is a consequence of external crises, external crises that from a point of view of public health 
in the countries hosting refugees is unmanageable. Here, uh, politics uh, needs uh, to come in to actually try and help sort out um, the reasons why people migrate. There are um, and have been uh, legal frameworks available and in place since after the Second World War, which would be sufficient uh, to look after refugees from a public health point of view. But not all, all of them are fully implemented in all countries. And we only now see that EU um, has implemented the Temporary Protection direct Directive rather than the Dublin II agreement when it came uh, to looking after the refugees from Ukraine, meaning um, people from Ukraine are free to travel uh, within the EU, unlike uh, refugees uh, who fall under the Dublin II agreement. Uh, refugees from Ukraine do not have a residence uh, um, obligation. Um, they can move to places where they have family members, for example, whereas uh, Syrian refugees, for example, uh, were hosted in uh, mass shelters and were not able uh, to leave them. There are obstacles towards stakeholder engagement, which are quite similar to those faced uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. And that is in many countries, there are federal structures which make it difficult to implement national policies. And the same, of course, then applies to EU level. Um, it's quite difficult to come up with the EU policy towards refugees um, and uh, an agreement to, towards distributing refugees uh, to various EU countries, because not e all EU governments uh, were um, in agreement uh, with such regulations. From the point of public health, housing of refugees is a very important topic and occasionally the impression uh, is that accommodation housing serves almost as a deterrence, um, as a kind of negative pull factor because accommodation um, often is camp-like um, as we see in uh, the Greek islands where there is little possibility to actually move refugees then uh, to, let's say, Germany, for example. And within uh, some countries, such as Germany, those refugees who make it uh, to the country are faced with restricted social and health services, which is not in line with what they should actually um, be um, given and uh, afforded. The temporary protection uh, directive, again, is a positive move in this direction because here refugees uh, from Ukraine, for example, can obtain full medical services, unlike those from Syria. One major issue, and that again uh, reminds us of the COVID pandemic, is the unsystematic data collection. And that affects then problems, uh, then, then affects uh, problem identification, surveillance, and of course, evaluation and correction of any problems that occur um, when looking after refugees. It is also quite common that the focus of attention is on problems that are in, phase, in fact not really the top priorities, such, such as tuberculosis screening. We see that again um, with Ukrainian refugees uh, in Germany who have to undergo TB screening uh, when they are accommodated in mass shelters. TB incidence in Ukraine is considerably higher uh, than in Germany, but still the number of people you would need to screen to identify even one positive case is very high. So instead, structural health issues uh, should be um, tackled. And that is the under provision um, of uh, vaccines uh, in refugee shelters uh, that concerns measles and the risk of measles outbreaks. And of course, um, in mass shelters, risks of foodborne uh, diseases such as rotavirus due to the large number of people um, living together in occasionally rather poor conditions. Clearly, and this follows again uh, the PR3 uh, approach, uh, plans and protocols are needed 
um, that take into consideration um, the possibility of new refugee migrations. Um, some aspects are difficult uh, to cover. For example, it's very difficult to provide a backup uh, of housing of flats uh, for refugees um, simply because of the cost and of the scarcity uh, of this uh, commodity. Also, in many countries, the medical health services are scarce, are under-provisioned, even in situations where there are no refugees. So this is clearly an area that needs additional funding. Having said that, I'll come to one um, aspect that we in uh, the um, peaceful countries uh, consider rather as a push factor of migration, but which of course also has a PR3 component, uh, so to say, and that is war. Um, from a European perspective, until recently, it was a rare event, uh, Yugoslavia and um, the smaller, one should say, wars um, started by Russia uh, were the exceptions. There is very low preparedness in uh, the European countries that were not at war for many decades now. And a problem, uh, of course, is the inherently low health system resilience uh, when it comes uh, to war, both in terms of the countries which are not directly affected, um, uh, but of course, um, mainly for those countries in which war takes place. As far as the prevention potential is concerned, public health uh, can do quite uh, very little in terms of prevention wars. This again is the area of politics. What happens uh, when a war starts is that public health needs to move back from new public health. Um, where we are trying to promote good health, back to old public health, where we are literally repairing uh, problems instead of promoting health and looking at issues such as safe water, sufficient food supply um, that seemed to be uh, issues of the past uh, in European countries. The consequences of war when seen from public health are of course the massive interruption of service delivery and that affects uh, not only the workforce but also the leadership, meaning um, the issue of how to organize the remaining uh, forces, the remaining wor workforce and services um, becomes uh, at times overwhelming. Clearly, there is also uh, the problem of interrupted data collection, which again affects uh, the problems of identification uh, of health issues, surveillance, evaluation and correction. We have heard today about experiences with radiation, biological and chemical agents. Um, the question that we need to discuss is to what degree these experiences, this scientific evidence is scalable when it comes to um, um, war being uh, fought with nuclear, biological or chemical weapon weapons. So far in the scenarios we have discussed today, um, there were intact healthcare systems, uh, an intact uh, political structure and um, the events were relatively limited which might not no longer be the case uh, in uh, an NBC war. So here, the breaking point of public health systems will inevitably be reached. Finally, the question of networking, and that is my last point. Within the Association of Schools of Public Health in the European region, ASFA, we are now setting up a network of expertise um, on public health in war. With that, thank you very much. For your attention. Thank you very much. Any specific questions uh, to Oliver? Uh, Gonzalo, please use the microphone. Well, three of them. It's the same question for. Fer. I don't know if it is the right moment or, or. Well, we were finishing this and moving to the discussion. So if there's no specific questions to this talk, then go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, well, first of all, thank you so much. It was really fascinating to, 
listen to all of you and, and you, can, you can see really <clears throat> some of the commonalities that we are willing to bring together. My question is, is about uh, balancing risks, uh, conflicting risks. And, and actually I was thinking, uh, Oliver, in the, in the case of your country in particular, Germany now, in the, in the, in, I mean, during the, the war in, in Ukraine, and we can see three of the cases that have been presented here, which are now uh, at, uh, part of the, of the policy dilemma that uh, the, the institutions and the governments have. No? One is related, of course, to how to handle, uh, uh, how to relate uh, to the war and how to best uh, handle policies in order to, to address the challenge of Russia and aggression. The other has to do with uh, energy provision and the dilemmas that Germany faces in this regard, uh, and in particular, mm, a, a revisiting the decision to close uh, nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear energy uh, provision in Germany. And the third is related to climate, because whatever is done in the other two decisions is going to... So my concrete questions to you is, what is the role of science in, uh, in, in advising governments that are challenged with this conundrum and how your three areas could work better together in assessing how to balance these different risks in that particular, that particular case. Thank you. I absolutely agree that um, public health is in a massive uh, dilemma here um, because um, of the different advices that uh, public health would give um, when it comes to uh, political interventions. Um, for example, uh, the economic, um, what's the English term, um, restrictions uh, towards Russia, of course, have a negative health effect, firstly, on the Russian population, uh, secondly, uh, on the less uh, well-off uh, parts of Western Euro European populations. So whatever advice uh, is given has negative sides uh, from, a, from a public health uh, point of view. Um, the role of scientists I see is to provide the best available evidence, um, taking into account the various perspectives, but then ultimately leave it to the politicians to take a decision. I of course have my personal opinion, but I find it very difficult to forward a personal opinion um, in place of uh, scientific advice. And this is why I would officially restrict my po position to a, balan a balanced view of the scientific evidence. Thank you. Can I, can I add Go ahead. one bit as well? Um, I think the responsibility of us scientists is that, first of all, that we share our data, that we share our knowledge, we don't keep it to ourselves. We, uh, we also make sure that we, uh, we, make, we get the science in place so we can have the right indicators in place, the right knowledge in place, the right science in place that we need to make a good decision-making framework that is more integrated and is more uh, interdisciplinary and also takes into account other, fac other factors, like uh, I mentioned in my presentation, I think all the others did as well, the impact on mental health, the impact on, uh, on society, the impact on, uh, on, e on the economy. And I think it's, it's our duty that we get that uh, uh, get that fixed because we don't have something that, that yet. Everybody's still working in their own silos. And I think so that's such why it's such a good thing that we're here together to discuss this. Thank you. Others? May yes, I? Sorry. Uh, okay, sorry, Thierry and then uh, Vincent. Okay, go on. Okay, ju just uh, briefly to continue on, on, on your question. Uh, with regard to radiological issue and nuclear accident, uh, it's clearly at stake with multi-dimension because, uh, as you mentioned, the war uh, in Ukraine posed a question of uh, what about the future of nuclear energy, but also what about the threats on existing nuclear installation and also on the Chernobyl site. So you have facing a complexity of, of, uh, of situation. Uh, in fact, with regard to that, the role of science 
uh, as you mentioned, need to, uh, to share uh, available information, but also to highlight uh, the, the limit of knowledge, the uncertainty associated with that, and then the key point that finally you have no uh, ideal solution. You have to balance uh, different aspects. You have to take into account that the risk still exists, but then you, you, never, you will never accept a risky situation. What you will accept will be in which way it will uh, allow to uh, promote as much as possible well-being, good health, and protect the environment. But then, of course, uh, science can be, uh, I, science is very useful for that. Uh, then one point which may uh, be further discussed is what could be also the role of citizens to provide science. Uh, and and I, I, listening to the different presentation, I'm sure that we, we may uh, make some further progress in terms of citizen science, because at least uh, people uh, will be directly uh, concerned. It's not only a matter for scientists, it's not only a matter for politics, it's really a, a matter for society. So I think this situation clearly uh, shows that we there is need to foster science, there is need to foster preparedness, uh, and with regard to nuclear accidents, this is important, but this is not because you are prepared that you will uh, accept or you, you will be enjoyed when you will have an accident. So I, I, it's a really a, a complex situation. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very interesting point. I mean, when we think about the rule of science, for example, I think that uh, for the case of Ukraine, I think, Elizabeth, you know, we are trying to uh, do something uh, as much as we can, trying to understand what are the levels of uh, radiations that were possibly raised. We don't know anything about it, but uh, due to military operation of the Russians on Chernobyl and maybe also in another plant, we're that I think this is a way where science can try to help providing evidence that if you do any sort of military operation in certain places, you can have, you can show that the the, the, the level of radiation can increase. And so at that point, you can work with Russians, with colleagues from Belarus, who cares, for colleagues from Ukraine, and come up with data, working on scientific data. And based on this data, you may, I mean, agree that any type of military operation should be absolutely forbidden. I mean, of course, they don't, they, they can go anyways, but at least we, we as scientists, I think, we, we should try to make the point that you, you, you definitely don't want to, cannot do this. And if you do it, it, I mean, it's all your responsibility. But I think that the, in, in, in a case like this, for example, science can really provide evidence and numbers are numbers. And wherever you are, you are from, I mean, you cannot say this is the wrong number or whatever. So you, we can have a, a scientific discussion, a technical discussion, of course, uh, based on the evidence, and once we have ev scientific evidence, that evidence can translate into international policy, I don't know, uh, where we can make the point that absolutely, absolutely, nobody should go close to certain areas. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we had the, the Wesson. So we have some questions here. We have some questions in the chat too. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, all panelists for this uh, nice presentation and bringing their uh, experience to, to this important forum. Uh, my question addressed to uh, Dr. Anya, and also I think it can apply for other uh, presenters, about how, how do you see the future of IHR after COVID-19? Uh, you mentioned in your presentation and quoted that IHR is a shared responsibility uh, among the world to prevent outbreaks. And uh, as you know, IHR looking for countries to strengthen their capacity in detection, assessment, and reporting, and also uh, notification and responding. Uh, let me give example about South Africa. When they invested a lot in detection and they have a good surveillance system, and also invested, taking a step forward to invest in pathogen genomic sequencing and doing good surveillance system, so they become able to detect variant quickly, 
then start reporting this and become transparent model to report this variant quickly to, to WHO. So this enable different country to take appropriate measures. So how the country, how the world responded to this? They faced them with travel ban, travel restriction, which affected their, their economy. So how do you see the future of IHR following this model? If country Y start not investing in their surveillance system, not transparent, not sharing information, they will not face with the same challenges that South Africa faced after investing in, in IHR core capacities. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. I didn't catch your name. Maybe you can say who you are and where you work my, from. my name is Wissam Mankula. I'm the lead for the Emergency Operations Center in Africa, CDC. Okay, thank you. For WHO? African CDC. Oh, for, so African CDC, sorry. No, I, I totally agree. I think this is one of the, mo uh, one, one of the long list of evaluation points that, uh, that should be addressed. And I think uh, the, uh, I heard last week on a, on a congress that we were, but WHO was also giving a presentation that uh, the, I, uh, the international health regulation will be under revision and uh, a good evalu evaluation will take place. And I think this is a very important lesson learned. Uh, I'm, me, myself, was, I, I was, uh, I also had to deal with these travel bans, and we also questioned them, and exactly for the, for the reason you just mentioned. And um, so I think you're right. I, so for the future, what that means is that you have to um, know what the implications are of such travel bans, but also what the what it means that, 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 that somewhere you find a new variant, and I think this is still going on, of course, because we still find variants every day. Um, but I think now already you can say that once it is seen in, in South Africa or in South America or in the Netherlands, um, with the, the, the way we travel and the way we travel now, uh, since all the restrictions are gone, it, it, it simply means that it is already in a lot of countries. So what is what is the 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 real impact on the spread of the disease of these travel bans and I think this is something that also is a responsibility for us scientists to to get the facts straight for that yeah thank you for your question very important okay we have quite a few questions you and then Tony and then we have people online and okay <laughs> please introduce yourself mm -hmm. oh oops Hello, I'm Nathalie Strupp from the N Drugs for Neglected Disease uh, Initiative. Thank you very much. It's really very interesting what you've been presenting. Mike, I have two questions. One for preparedness. Um, how much of the programs that some of you have developed are shared or you know, applicable, shared with low and middle income countries? Because uh, obviously it's, it's not a European problem, it's a worldwide problem. So how much of the knowledge and the, you know, the capacity has been shared? Number two, uh, for the response, do we have examples in any country? I was impressed by the World, Health, uh, the World Trade uh, Center Health uh, Center <laughs> uh, program, sorry. Yeah, are there other examples where you link, you know, um, a disaster that is not directly a health one with a health response that we can learn for and uh, from to to develop um, you know learn from this and have further programs thank you okay, uh, uh, here please say ah uh, no 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 just okay they need to respond sorry because I see the microphone going over there Uh, obviously, we have a lot of sharing uh, within uh, our sort of uh, organization with, within occupational and environmental health. I would say that this is not enough to me because it's a kind of a, not a limited circle, but it's kind of a circle of uh, uh, persons who are basically into this kind of uh, exposure assessment and uh, preparedness within the occupational and environmental health. Uh, but now I think it's a time to make this more global in a way because it's not only related to uh, technical and, uh, and specific, uh, specific uh, procedures. I think it, it, it's very important, very relevant on a, on a wider uh, uh, perspective. So I think it's uh, the time to consider also these aspects within uh, larger policies 
on emergency preparedness because uh, when something happens, I, I showed the examples of Beirut and, uh, and Durham and also Miami. I mean, we're, the response is even zero or still suboptimal. Uh, I experienced the, 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 the new situation in Miami because I was there and, I, and even if there is a knowledge from 9-11, even if there's a lot of uh, uh, collaboration, coordination, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when you're there, when things are real, it's not that easy. It's, it's still a, a fight, a, literally a fight to convince people you should wear this mask because it's, uh, you don't see, but you, we know that this is uh, very, very toxic, so you have to be prepared. And so it's always kind of a, an effort. And I think that this is because uh, there's a lack of uh, major regulation at the higher level. I con I'm convinced that this, we're still lacking a, a, a stronger, uh, I mean, uh, regulations about these things because otherwise you, you all, you're always there like uh, it's the first time that this happened. It's not the first time. We have a lot of previous experience. So why are we here still <laughs> discussing who should do what and, and, and having to, to convince people when there's a lot of scientific evidence that uh, there is a danger, there's something that needs to be ready for. And so, but to answer your questions, uh, I mean, the 9-11 program is, uh, I think is the, I mean, I know the others. I, there's, one, there's one for Chernobyl, which is still active. I, I mean, uh, and, and we were in contact. <laughs> now it's a little bit difficult. Uh, but of course there is this uh, communication. Um, Cervezo, there's a, it's a very, no, a very old uh, situation that happened, happened in Italy. Uh, it, it, there's still research going on and, uh, and so we try to keep us uh, in contact and try to share experiences. In, in a way this is important to improve our approaches and try to be more in collaboration. But again, I think uh, it's time to go to an, a, 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 a different level because when something happens again, I mean, it's very unfortunate. Uh, I mean, the situation in Beirut, I know Beirut, uh, uh, Lebanon has a very difficult economical situation. So, but still a lot of people involved in, in those things, th those types of accidents, nobody cares. I mean, this is not acceptable. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Right. Yeah, um, I wanted to add to that that um, obviously uh, volcanoes are present around the world, um, but often in um, countries which are less economically developed. And it's those underserved communities that really require our support <clears throat> in capacity building responses because uh, they're not in the situation for, to be able to develop these um, responses for themselves. Um, I have to say that our on the ground experience has been that it is often very, very difficult to build preparedness and resilience at a local level when there is no eruption um, unrest, as it were, um, because it's, you know, people, these areas have got their other challenges and convincing people that this is the thing they need to focus on and prepare for when there's no sign of the big mountain behind them behaving badly, it, it's extremely challenging. Um, so we've tried to work with local communities, local health agencies, the Pan American Health Organization supported us in holding a workshop to try and embed the epidemiological protocols um, in the um, health response plans of a number of um, Latin American government agencies. Uh, these things just fall by the wayside. Uh, people are too busy, you know, a pandemic happens or, um, you know, a, another public health crisis. and. Um, it's very, very difficult from our perspective to actually um, have effective preparedness. And that's, that's just what I wanted to add. Yeah, just a few points with regard to a uh, nuclear accident. In fact, the, the preparedness of uh, expert and national authority for nuclear accident I is relatively well organized. Uh, with regard to the response of the national level. Then the weak point is really 
how to uh, involve uh, the local uh, local authority, uh, but of course also the different stakeholders because to to be ready to for for local community to be uh, involved in uh, the preparedness of nuclear accidents this is not so trivial uh, and, and this is something uh, to be worked with. Uh, the other point uh, is the fact that even uh, for uh, the authority, uh, and especially at the local level, but sometimes at the national level, people are changing their role quite regularly. Uh, and then you need to have uh, uh, a sustainable uh, knowledge uh, to, have th to develop the culture, the awareness uh, regularly to, to these people in order that they really understand what is at stake. And this is not so, so simple. Uh, and then currently, uh, there are some uh, activity at the international level and uh, some national countries are, are going on with that is really to, to think not only to have the early response but to think about the future uh, and, and to anticipate what could be uh, the resilience uh, of uh, communities and this is something uh, on which for sure the old hazard approach uh, could uh, significantly help uh, to address this issue. Uh, because uh, I think that's also a very good question and I think also amongst the things that have been said, uh, another thing is that there's also a shared global responsibility that uh, education is in place, of course, in low and middle income countries, that the skills are there in place, but also that we find a way to keep their brilliant scientists there and that they don't feel the need to go to Harvard or to, uh, that, that there's, that is attractive to stay in those countries as well. I don't know what, 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 uh, what could trigger that. I think something to think about as well, because you need science in place in the countries as well. Thank you very much, Ella. Ian, just on the question about whether we do and what we do in the countries of the Global South, I mean, in terms of climate change, this is probably, uh, uh, you know, those countries uh, are worse off than the more developed countries. A lot of research and all uh, uh, many of our activities are directed exactly to those. There are a number of examples that I could mention. The uh, climate risk assessment, uh, the climate simulation are provided for free uh, for all countries at the global scale. There are efforts to develop uh, uh, hubs uh, with uh, climate services that are uh, fully tailor-made to the need of the specific countries. Uh, for example, in Africa, we're working on uh, on the building the capability to, to adapt to climate change, uh, including via the UNFCCC programs. There is a Warsaw International mechanism that is uh, directly addressing the loss and damage, material, cultural, economic, um, uh, non-material damage and losses from climate change and how, how those uh, damages might be, if not compensated, reduced or uh, somehow uh, made, made manageable. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, in terms of climate change, uh, the bulk of the research and innovation goes to the countries of global uh, south and it's being developed in their places and together with them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Tony. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Tony Plasencia from, from Miss Global. So my question, uh, looking at the commonalities, has a lot has a bit to do with uh, the area of governance and uh, uh, the, the some one of the previous questions uh, dealt on that a little bit but more specifically uh, I have two questions one is do you think uh, as you know as in this COVID area I, I don't dare saying post-COVID yet uh, there's a discussion about the pandemic treaty the need uh, the potential need for a pandemic treaty do you think uh, First of all, more from the health standpoint, that this is necessary. Uh, from an infectious disease standpoint, sorry, uh, this is necessary. And what are a little bit the feelings uh, from the other areas in terms of somehow a high level, the, the need for a higher level of uh, agreement and instruments uh, putting together not only infectious disease or the pandemic uh, um, approach, but also the approach to the other health, uh, global health threats that we've discussed. And the other thing, uh, and I have in mind that 
uh, a reasonably recent paper in, in the Lancet looking at the determinants of the impact of the epidemic at the end of the day largely depended on trust. Uh, much more than health systems, much more than uh, the health response and, and, and other capabilities that we would think would make the difference. But apparently, and that's a study uh, uh, involving 120 uh, countries or so, at the end, uh, trust, uh, both trust in the institutions and interpersonal trust, so mm, trusting your neighbor somehow, uh, trusting the scientists around uh, seems to make the difference. And I'm saying, I'm asking this, because uh, for those of you who have uh, the experience of setting up or working in institutions, in executive institutions, as, as far as I've seen, that have a role to, to get things done, uh, what are you, your, uh, your recommendations or your thoughts, especially after the, 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 pandemic, uh, the pandemic experience? And in a context where, uh, for example, in Europe, there's the, the whole uh, HERA has been set, and there will be discussions on, on uh, what does this agency need to do and what do countries need to do in terms of uh, strengthening their capabilities and maybe developing new sorts of organization in, in different ways. So that's my two questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, shall I respond to the first question first about the uh, pandemic treaty? Yeah, so um, well, w what we've already said and, and uh, already uh, advocated for, 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 for ages is that pandemics will happen and pandemics will return. I mean, the circumstances are still there in which this pandemic um, developed. So, and it's only getting worse with almost eight, 8 billion people on this globe and, and, and animals and climate change, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these cascading eff effects. So yes, I think it's a very good thing that there is a pandemic treaty, but actually you want uh, a more integrated treaty that takes into account other uh, threats and risks and, and look, uh, looks at it in a more integrated way. But I think it's a very good first step. Um, that, yeah, so I think it's a very good a a first step. And I think we could also use that momentum for other, for other, uh, for other risks. For example, also within infectious diseases, I've been working for many years on antimicrobial resistance, and this wasn't a sexy topic. <laughs> Nobody liked it. There's n not much money to make in it. Uh, you want to develop new antibiotics uh, to put on the shelf uh, for in case all the other do don't work anymore. Uh, so this is an example that you really need uh, a, b a big strong force from politics saying, okay, this is important. We need to change this if we want to keep this planet uh, a place where we can, where our children and uh, can stay living. Yeah, then I think I it's a very good th thing, and uh, I hope um, they will make it broader than just pandemics. Do you want Maybe somebody else wants to. Yeah, I, I I can come back on some element with regard to health issues that I didn't develop too much in the presentation uh, after uh, the Chernobyl and Fukushima accident. We have a series of uh, health aspects, not only uh, radiation related. Uh, the first of all with radiation related is of course the thyroid uh, cancer and disorder. And with regard to that, uh, we may uh, make some progress uh, in terms of preparedness and response uh, to really uh, not only identify uh, what, what are the, the cases, but really to accompany the people and to, uh, to help uh, to understand what is at stake, to help to protect uh, and to have a, a significant follow-up where science can inform uh, the situation. In addition, uh, there are some key concerns for the local population about uh, the future generation. And then when you check the current, uh, epi current uh, uh, scientific information on heritable effects, you have some uncertainty, uh, and then at the end, people have no, uh, have, have no clear message. Is it safe? Is it unsafe? Uh, and then, for sure, we need to really uh, work on that and be more, not only transparent, but uh, uh, understandable, and to work together to have a significant follow-up 
uh, for, for the population. Uh, currently, uh, in, uh, in the international organization like UNSCARE and ICRP, there is a work on, on this topic, uh, but at the end, maybe it will be a, a significant scientific development, but how to cope with the direct concern of local population with regard to that. Uh, another aspect uh, is also all the, as all the, the, the disease who, who are who health impact associated with disturbance of daily life. After uh, any event, uh, also after COVID, uh, we have disturbance of our daily life and independently from the direct effect uh, of the, the, tra the trees, you, you have uh, some, some, ap some, some uh, impact uh, on, on some disease impact, some mental health uh, impact, and there is a need uh, to better cope with that. At the beginning, in the case of radiation, uh, when we check uh, the, the mental aspect, we say that people uh, are not aware of the scientific knowledge, but this is not the, the good response. The people are affected and you need to consider significantly uh, that they are affected and they may uh, develop some uh, mental health uh, disorder uh, due to the fact that their, li their daily life and their, their situation is no more the same uh, as before. Uh, and this is something on which we may uh, better uh, address what does it mean the well-being of people and how to follow, to have a good follow-up of the evolution of the well-being and which type of preventive or protective action could be implemented to help uh, people to recover and to improve uh, progressively or to have a good resilience. Well, I, I think that the, the pandemic and the, and the climate change and the war and, the, and all these kind of uh, situations are in a way uh, giving us uh, a lot of uh, responsibility in a way because we as scientists we really need to uh, try to keep all these elements uh, as much as possible uh, communicating because they're not separating that I mean uh, we, we, we have seen that the uh, impact of uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, disease severity and mortality in northern Europe uh, in northern Italy sorry uh, was linked to air pollution, for example. I mean, uh, I'm in the province of uh, Brescia and Bergamo in northern Italy, where they were highly impacted, and we show that there's a, uh, there was a, an association with the uh, uh, recent exposure, but also the chronic ex exposure to PM10 and PM2.5. And, 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 and I mean, the uh, interpretation of that can be, I mean, of two types. One, that uh, the uh, airborne pollutants, they can uh, kind of uh, uh, transport the virus and spread it. Uh, that is still controversial. The other one is like, uh, I think, more plausible that uh, exposure to air pollution can create vulnerability for respiratory function. So therefore, those areas that are particularly impacted by air pollution, they could be more vulnerable to uh, other, other, uh, uh, you know, threats like COVID uh, and, and who knows what. So I think that uh, there's communication, there's interactions, all these elements are not unrelated. And so as scientists, I think, uh, I, I believe it's like uh, the momentum. I don't know if it is a momentum, but, but maybe, maybe, maybe it is. Uh, and so we have to focus on, uh, on all possible, I think, uh, interactions also. Interactions are important. We never want to focus only on one element. We want to see what if we have two or three combined together. And there's a lo lot of tools and, uh, and uh, scientific advancements are also in biostatistics now to consider the interactions and, the m and, and all these multiple uh, 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 challenges that can threat the, uh, the human body. So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's time to try to collaborate also on these things. We have a lot of questions from the public, uh, from the uh, for online, and we have questions there. <laughs> so, um, and we have very little time, so maybe we'll try to do them a little bit more quickly. Um, there was, uh, okay, there was uh, one question about, uh, does any of the presenters have a sustainable 
structure for capacity building in resource poor countries. Uh, you have a sustainable structure for uh, capacity building in resource poor countries. Nathalie? Or <laughs> some? No? Yahasta? Maybe this is something that's more for this afternoon's session, actually. Yeah? Uh, there was maybe the one from yeah. Aubrey? Aubrey is commenting. Yeah, so there's a comment from Aubrey Miller from uh, the NIH in the US. Uh, who says we need to build a vibrant community of practice that al allows a non-institutional intellect and expertise to be rapidly accessed and included in disaster response to help define critical research gaps, share expertise, and lend to robust and diverse data collection in concert with the formal uh, response efforts by institutions, which has limited bandwidth beyond acute epidemiology and surveillance. And there are good models of such efforts in the US, Canada, and other countries. Any comments? Yeah, Thierry? I, I can make a, a quick comment on that. Uh, in, in fact, after the Chernobyl and the Fukushima, and more, more after the Fukushima accident, due to the acceleration of the, the circulation of information with social media, uh, clearly all the decisions were uh, challenged uh, by uh, different uh, different information coming from uh, uh, different origin. Uh, and then, of course, there is a, a key challenge for uh, um, preserving or restoring the trust uh, in all the decision and, and, and the, the information which uh, was provided by the authority. This is not so simple uh, in the emergency phases. Uh, there is a need to respond quickly. Uh, and then, of course, if you have not prepared in advance, this is quite uh, difficult to be sure that you, you, will, uh, you will be trusted and uh, all the decisions will be challenged. Then uh, the key point is that progressively, there is a need to uh, set up as much as possible uh, participation of, of stakeholders. But, but then, uh, if... Uh, the trust is no more there, the stakeholder participation is not so simple, and, and there is a need uh, as much as possible to rely on some organization which could be uh, sufficiently independent or autono uh, with some autonomy uh, in order to, to be, to not to be considered uh, as uh, directly uh, involved in the, in the situation. Uh, after the Fukushima accident, there was a, a clear uh, challenge for the authority and the, the safety authority and nuclear safety authority have been uh, reorganized uh, in order to try to uh, get more autonomy in their decision. But uh, in any case, uh, there is uh, still uh, a clear uh, stress on the the, ro the role and responsibility of all organizations, and this is something with regard to the governance that we may uh, better consider, uh, including uh, the, the fact that you may have some uh, decision at the national level or international level, which are not directly adapted to the local situation. And this is something in terms of governance that I think we may uh, reinforce the articulation between uh, international, national, regional, and local I in order to, to be sure that we will, uh, as much as possible, embark uh, the different stakeholders. Thank you. <coughs> uh, we will take one more from the public and then a couple from back there very quickly. So we have a question here. Do you have any study providing evidence on how different societies more or less developed with high or low inequalities have dealt with different threats, whether it's nuclear, biological, chemical wars, and how they have recovered from these events. Are there differences in, in how they de deal with and how they recover? I don't know, maybe uh, Roberto, you were talking about the US, you were talking about Africa. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can we can just uh, think about this historically, thinking about Bhopal and uh, and those events where the response was absolutely 
absolutely in existence, almost in existence, thinking about Bhopal and, and still now, and Beirut and all these cases where, uh, and, and South Africa as well. I mean, unfortunately, there's a difference, of course. The United States with this uh, uh, World Trade Center health program is a model uh, uh, because of the resources. And uh, even the, the health program from Chernobyl, I mean, we, we've been in, in interestingly in contact um, until before the war because uh, both programs, they have some similarities still the, in, 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 in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. There are cases where they discuss whether this can be related to the exposure or not, very similarly to what is done within the 9-11 the program. So there was an exchange, uh, and, and that unfortunately is being impacted clearly, uh, but that exchange is fundamental between programs, between models, and uh, I think that the uh, collaboration and uh, the, the work with uh, colleagues from, uh, from other countries where there's no resources, it's also fundamental because we have to try to help them. Pandemic point of view, I think the first studies are just starting to be done that really look uh, from, um, that really evaluate in the right way um, uh, what, what was done, what worked during the crisis, what didn't work. And we've seen uh, several evaluations in the Netherlands at least that were mainly on a high, higher level, like how did the governance work, who made w which decisions, and course the parliament is asking several questions but really a good uh, evaluation from a scientific point of view i haven't seen an overview of all the countries uh, of several countries in the world yet but uh, i think we should really do that i also uh, mentioned that before regarding the previous question in claire very briefly and then we still have two more questions and we have about one minute two minutes go on claire <laughs> Yeah, so before the pandemic, um, we did a big study related to uh, the use of face masks in volcanic settings, um, and that also related to people's uh, ability to protect themselves and to then recover from a volcanic eruption. But I think it's very relevant to COVID as well. So we did a comparative uh, behavioral study in um, Mexico, Indonesia, and Japan. So we chose three different countries of different economic settings. And uh, to summarize a huge amount of data, what we found was that people's trust in the local authorities, um, whether they were official or unofficial authorities, hugely influenced their ability and willingness and motivation to protect themselves. So I think that plays through to COVID as well. And people's, um, you know, in relation to face masks, for example, and taking other mitigation measures, um, people's trust in the people asking them to do that um, has had a huge influence on whether they're willing to do that. We actually found that the, the, the level of economic development didn't relate um, to this. It was more related to the relationship with the local authorities. Okay. Yaroslav, very briefly, because we have two more, co two more questions. Yeah, just uh, uh, to mention, I mean, shouldn't this be part of the public accountability to after, you know, uh, um, a certain disaster strikes to review whether the public response to this disaster was, uh, uh, was uh, inclusive, was uh, efficient and effective in, uh, in reducing the impacts. A few examples we have here are comparing uh, the responses to certain disaster strikes like uh, floods, uh, the pan-European, uh, the central European flood in 2000. 2013 in a, a sort of comparative twin assessment where you look into how the adaptive capacity changed over the time and uh, you know the same intensity of hazard uh, what kind of impact it caused okay we have two brief questions in the back and then uh, we will break for lunch <laughs> but we will keep a track of all the questions send them to all of the experts and perhaps then we can share responses huh? Last person standing between us and lunch. Um, hi, Dave Lawrence from the Global Fund. Uh, thanks to all the presenters for great presentations. Um, I wanted to follow up on Dr. Placencia's um, kind of second question about the issue of trust and extend that beyond some of the really compelling peer review uh, reports that have come out. Um, but the, the issue of trust has, has, trust has come out very very strongly in some of the WHO convenings looking at the joint external evaluation 
um, the the start the uh, state party's annual reporting um, framework and indicators, and it's something they're actively working to bolster within the updated frameworks. So, I had a question specifically for Dr. Schreier on this. Dr. Schreier, you, you talked about um, potentially a a threat um, level kind of framework for socializing, bringing the kind of community into into the process of thinking about preparedness. Um, I'm curious, do you have other, when we think about the, the current frameworks, community engagement is focused on risk communication, but when we think about the broader enterprise of preparedness, there's much more at stake. And, and how are you thinking in the Netherlands and how in countries like South Africa should we be thinking in innovative ways about engaging communities much more broadly in the preparedness enterprise so they, they view it as a shared response, actually, as a shared enterprise. Over. Sorry, over, over was my uh, virtual uh, <laughs> modality. Did I respond to that? Yeah, yeah no, uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, well, I think in some of the other fields within infectious diseases, we've tried to do that. Like, for example, in vaccination strategies, we really try to make a stepwise approach that we really um, first do some uh, quantitative research in where, where the, the gaps are, and then you really do your qualitative research where you uh, do focus group interviews, really try to find those barriers and motivators and translate those into... Uh, targeted interventions. So we have done that in the past, but we haven't done that um, well during this crisis. Um, and um, so this is, that's one of the lessons learned, and I think how to uh, have that dialogue that, uh, that was also mentioned in your presentation with the community, and also to give them an idea of the several scenarios, what could happen and what they can do themselves. Uh, what is their... Um, uh, th their, th their what kind of action can they do themselves? How can we teach them how to do it in the right way? Uh, and I say them, but it's of course also me, <laughs> as being one of uh, being uh, an inhabitant of the Netherlands. And um, so, yeah, I think it's it's something that should be further developed. And I think as scientists have a role in in, in finding the right ways. Uh, to do proper research in how do you have the, the, the uh, right dialogue with the community and also not only within the silo of pandemics but in the full broad of it. Um, and it's very challenging. Uh, for example, um, the Netherlands, as you might know, is under, under sea level and um, so, uh, some, some of the solutions that we find for dealing with that cause causes more problems in infectious diseases because it uh, it makes uh, it, it, it it gives uh, certain areas where there's more water and it will get give give more mosquitoes or certain birds and those uh, can uh, of course uh, carry certain infectious so it's also here a very uh, uh, an important case of of integrating science in front and also engaging the general public with that uh, I think in, in the context of nuclear accidents, there's been a lot of work, a lot of research and stakeholder engagement at every step from the preparedness phase to the response and so on, including um, basically um, enabling citizens to make measurements, make their own measurements of doses so that actually it helps to build their resilience, it helps them decide what to do with their lives and so on, and, and basically also involving them in preparedness uh, actions. I don't know if you want to say something more, Thierry, about that? Yeah, yeah well, <coughs> with, with regard to this question of preparedness, so I, I will not go too much in detail, but my, my feeling is that one, one key point, as I mentioned, is in which way you are able to, to, to have the commitment of, of local stakeholders, which is not uh, so trivial. You may have uh, good planning and say it's good that people are informed in advance, but how to make them uh, committed uh, with uh, not only one short information, but uh, to really be embarked in some, prog some preparedness program. The second aspect is in which way you can uh, disseminate uh, this information to a broader uh, public, a broader audience, and 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 then you have to find some uh, uh, some some momentum where uh, this is meaningful. Otherwise, 
if you start to deliver information uh, without a specific context, uh, that will be useless and people uh, will not uh, have a grip on, on what is really at stake and what is useful. So with regard to that, I'm sure, but we may uh, further discuss that uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm sure that the all hazard approach uh, could be one way uh, to better cope with this situation uh, because you can't be uh, prepared for everything uh, separately. You need to have some commonalities and, and for sure uh, we may uh, make some progress in this perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, we run out of time. Uh, so unless there's any urgent question, I would propose that we, uh, that we move to the lunch break. And I'd like to thank all of the panelists for their excellent talks and, uh, and the excellent discussion. And to th all of you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we are in Spain, so this is lunch break at 2 o'clock, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we three. will reconvene uh, in, uh, at 3 o'clock for the institutional workshop. So the lunch is uh, outside, downstairs. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who are listening to us. We'll be back in a bit less than an hour.